No one gets to cheat death, at least not in this world. Best case, you die the death of your choice. For me, you know, I'm just fading away after a sound night's sleep, my old age, when I still have my health, and mental faculties. That sounds pretty good. Just a nice rest that just kind of peacefully fades into death. Worst case, you end up as a Darwin Award winner for doing something stupid, reckless, just otherwise totally unnecessary that takes you out of the gene pool before you ever needed to leave. Actually, to win a Darwin Award, you don't have to die. You can also needlessly castrate or otherwise sterilize yourself in some horrific fashion. The Darwin Awards are a tongue-in-cheek honor originating in old Usenet news group discussions around 1985. The awards recognize individuals who contribute to evolutionary natural selection by removing themselves from the gene pool. The Darwin Awards website is launched in 1993 and has been celebrating cartoonishly unnecessary death ever since. And we're going to look at several ridiculous winners slash losers today. We're also going to look at evolution itself today. Is it really just a theory? We'll give an overview of Charles' father of evolution, Darwin's life. We'll even take a peek into the premise of Mike Judge's cult classic film, Idiocracy. Has removing natural evolutionary death from the human species via medical and technological innovations created an anti-evolution trend that will eventually lead to a world full of idiots? Is our collective human IQ heading downhill because the least successful and educated humans amongst us seem to oftentimes breed the most? Little blend of knowledge and dark humor today. I guess that's always the recipe, really, here on Time Suck. Hope you enjoy our take on how not to die and how evolution is supposed to help keep you alive today on Time Suck. You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, Time Suckers. Work can wait. It's time for Time Suck. Hope you're enjoying June. Year's flying by. I'm Dan Cummins, the master sucker. He who doesn't care for Albert Fish's peanut butt butter. He who does enjoy bananas more than the average meat sack. And you are listening to Time Suck. Hail Nimrod, hail Lucifina, praiseable jangles, and glory be to Triple M. Recording the Suck Dungeon with Reverend Dr. Joe motherfucking Paisley and script keeper Zach Flannery. And we're loving the summer weather. Taking lunch breaks outside. You ready for summer? Summer has hit the Suck Dungeon for sure. Flowers are in bloom. Trees have leaves. Lawns are green here in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Hail summer. And just in time for summer, we're selling a limited edition pint glass set featuring four 16-ounce glasses, each printed with an Axis Apparel designed original time suck insect or other critter. While I love our t-shirts, we know that many of you just don't want t-shirts. We hope this is an enjoyable non-shirt item for you. The deadly head-eating ombre assassino ants. The poisonous eyelid lifting Roanoke recluse spider, the pesky North American land crab capable of flying short distances like a small little helicopter, and the original, the West Caribbean sea chicken, living under the water and laying underwater eggs off the coast of Florida. $35 for the set, same price as the last limited edition pint glass set that sold out fast. These glasses are perfect for making the miracle elixir known as Ormus. I don't know if all of you, the space lizards have heard of Ormus. Maybe not all of you time suckers have, but basically you don't need medicine anymore. You just, you just make Ormus and it just cures everything. It can regrow limbs, everything. Just ask the people who sell it. You don't even have to infuse these glasses with positive energy. Normally you got to spend a lot of time infusing glasses with positive em- energy to make your Ormus. No, our glasses are pre-infused with 300% pure positive energy. Grab a set today, raise them high when you toast. Long live the suck. But I hope you check them out in the Time Suck store. Got some upcoming summer tour dates as well. Hope I had fun in Jacksonville last weekend. This was recorded before that trip. Look forward to making it to Omaha this weekend. Reminds me of the Counting Crows song every time I say it. And uh, I still love the August and Everything After album. And I know a lot of you don't. Feels like I get shit for liking it every time I mention it. But you know what? Adam Duritz, if you're listening to this, I fucking love every song you've ever written. And I think you're a musical genius. Uh, Next week, I'll be in Raleigh, North Carolina. And then I'm taking a midsummer vacation with my family. After I get back, uh, and by my family, I mean, uh, there's this hot lady I met on the web and some, uh, some other kids I'm going to borrow to take, uh, just, you know, just get a little break from life here in Coeur d'Alene. Kidding. <laughs> Can you imagine? I should tell Lindsay that. Yeah. Hey, I listen about a vacation. Just hear me out. I met a nice lady on the internet and she has a couple of kids. What if I swap your ticket and the kids tickets for them? Just, just, just to shake shit up. 
no, I don't want to do that. I'm looking forward to uh, hanging out with Lindsay and the kids. And then after I get back from vacation, I'm going to be in Cincinnati doing shows in July and August. I'll be all over the place. Charlotte, Richmond, Orlando, Los Angeles, San Diego. Woo-hoo! Lots of summer traveling to summery places. Now let's get back to the show. Today on Time Suck, we're going to laugh in the face of death, which won't be that hard to do because it's not our death we'll be laughing at. I'm strongly guessing it is way harder to laugh in the face of death if it is your own death than it is to laugh at others. Also guessing, easier to laugh at death when you're not in a place where you feel like you could die at any moment. I don't want to find out anytime soon. I don't want to test this hypothesis. Happy to live in a safe American neighborhood where no one that I know of is just being just, you know, raped and pillaged by fucking ransackers or, or anything else crazy happening. I don't hear any, any bombs going off in the streets. I enjoy it. We're going to take a long look at some of the most interesting Darwin Award recipients that we could find on the interwebs. And if you don't like dark humor, get, get the fuck out of here. This isn't your episode. This, this, this show isn't your show. Why are you even listening to any of this? Uh, before we look at the Darwin Awards, a topic chosen by our Patreon Space Lizards, by the way. Hail the Space Lizards. Thanks for allowing us to, uh, to make donations every month. Um, I haven't, at this, at this recording, picked out Lock down the, the June award. I think I know what it is. I don't want to say though in case we change our minds. But we're going to be giving over uh, over $2,200 to a new charity. But anyway, the, the Space Lizards picked this topic. And uh, in addition to just Darwin Award winners, which was the pick, we're also going to look at Charles Darwin, his theory of evolution. Give the awards a bit of context. Uh, and it's just a fun you know, excuse to use the awards uh, to learn more about evolution. I was, I was excited to look into it because I really haven't in a long, long time. So let's get to some learning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this isn't going to take very long to uh, talk about the theory of evolution. Uh, what is it? Well, in short, it is one of Beelzebub's many, many lies. And if you fall for his evolution, man from monkey trick, <laughs> well, have fun burning in hell, you fucking piece of shit. So that's settled. Moving along. Uh, let's get to the awards. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I, I hope that one person listening was like, yeah, yes, finally. Finally, we agree. Um, no kidding. But some people do truly feel that way. Agree to disagree. The theory of evolution by natural selection was first formulated in Charles Darwin's book on the origin of species in 1859. It's a process by which organisms change over time as a result of changes in heritable physical or behavioral traits. Changes that allow an organism to better adapt to its environment so it can stay alive. This is all about staying alive. Changes that will help it survive and, you know, have more offspring. Evolution by natural selection, one of the best substantiated theories in the entire history of science, supported by evidence from a wide variety of scientific disciplines, including paleontology, geology, genetics, uh, developmental biology. Brian Richmond, curator of human origins at the American Museum of Natural History, in New York City, a.k.a. Captain Smarty Pants, states that the theory has two main points. All life on Earth is connected and related to each other. He says, and the diversity of life is a product of modifications of populations by natural selection, where some traits were favored in an environment over others. The theory is sometimes described as survival of the fittest, but that can be a bit misleading in the context of evolution. Fittest doesn't refer to an organism's strength or athletic ability. It refers to its ability to survive and reproduce. And I just had the weirdest thought pop in my head that if it really was like survival of just the fittest and we were just like a fucking race of bodybuilders, just everyone is just a, a different size of bodybuilder. Just what a weird <laughs> human landscape that would look like. Uh, great example of evolutionary natural selection in recent action is illustrated by the changing color of the UK's peppered moth. Queen of the Suck, Lindsay and I had a fun conversation about this the other night. It was a little interesting trivia we both found. The peppered moth is widespread in Britain and Ireland and frequently found in everyday UK back gardens. It's totally ordinary, looking little flying bug, nothing special, uh, but it has a pretty special backstory. Peppered moths are normally white with black speckles across their wings. That color, color pattern is what led to its name. This particular patterning has kept it nice and camouflaged against the lichen-covered tree trunks it likes to kick its little moth feet up on during the day, uh, and it has been doing that for centuries. Sometimes a naturally occurring genetic mutation gives some of these gross little moths almost completely black wings. And I say gross because moths are one of the fucking creepiest bugs out there to me. Do not care for them. I don't like their erratic, little herky-jerky, 
little flying motion. Uh, I, don't, I don't like how heavy they feel when they can touch you. And I especially don't like their squishy little bodies and the weird moth dust that gets everywhere if you do squish them. I don't like how much guts they have. Give, give me the heebie-jeebies. Uh, don't like how they make me think of Mothman and how gross that creature would be if he was just a fucking big squishy sack of moth dust. Ugh, I'm getting way off track. Anyways, some moths are born with black coloring, not white with black speckles. That little genetic abnormality. And these moths stand out on the trees the species prefer to chill the fuck out on. And they end up getting eaten by birds and other predators at a much, much higher rate than their traditionally peppered moth bros and moth sisters. So usually, bad luck to be born with that little variation. However, in the 19th century, um, in, uh, yeah, and this is, yeah, going back to yeah, England, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, this is where this uh, uh, variation was noticed. In the 19th century, British folk living in increasingly densely populated towns and cities started noticing a lot more black moths and a lot fewer of the normally peppered variety. Turns out industrialization, domestic coal fires, had created an enormous amount of sooty air pollution, which had killed off a lot of the lichens, blackened urban tree trunks and walls. So now suddenly it was the pale form of the moth that was the most obvious to predators. Right, the darker form of the moth just happened to now be better camouflaged, more likely to survive and produce offspring. As a result, over successive generations, the black moths came to vastly outnumber the pale forms in UK towns and cities. This was observed by many, 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 many people, written about all kinds of stuff. Since moths are short-lived, the peppered moth uh, has an average lifespan of around eight to nine months. This evolution by natural selection happened quite quickly. You know, generation after generation was able to happen in a, in a short period of time. To show how quickly things changed, the first black peppered moth was recorded in Manchester, right? In Manchester, UK, by naturalists in 1848. By 1895, less than 50 years later, other naturalists determined that 98% of peppered moths in the industrialized area of Manchester were black moths. Moths way out in the country still remained primarily white. Then in the mid 20th century, controls were introduced to reduce air pollution. And as the air quality improved, tree trunks became cleaner, lichen growth increased. Once again, the normal pale pepper moths were camouflaged and the black forms were more noticeable. And then the situation in urban areas has again become the same as in the countryside, less pollution. And now normal pale pepper moths are far more common than the black version of the moth. So natural selection has been working in both directions on this species in the past few centuries always favoring the moth best suited to its current environmental conditions. Another even more recent example of evolution in action involves New England blue mussels. Now, beginning in 1991, a non-native creature, the Asian shore crab, showed up on the shores of New England. And these new crabs happened to find blue mussels to be absolutely delicious. Asian crabs gobble up blue mussels like Albert Fish used to slurp up peanut butter. Showbiz, my dear, that's how they do it in Hollywood. Well, in August of 2006, two researchers from the University of New Hampshire, Aaron Freeman, James Byers, announced that the blue mussel had evolved defenses against the new predator in just 15 years. Compared to the million plus year time scale we tend to think of when it comes to evolution, this is incredible. The blue mussel, in a decade and a half, built up a measurably thicker shell, making it nearly impossible for Asian crabs to crack and eat them right? Crack their shells and eat them. In areas of New England where the Asian crab has still not made it, muscle, muscle, yeah, shell thickness has remained unchanged. Only the mussels with abnormally thick shells survived in the areas of the Asian crabs, right? And then their offspring with the thickest shells survived and reproduced and so on and so on and so on, uh, quickly thickening their shells. Pretty amazing. Uh, my own family tree actually is an interesting example of evolution. Uh, I haven't talked about this before, but a lot of the women in my family, and by a lot, I mean, I mean, nearly all of the women in my family have, and I can't stress this enough, enormous vaginas. Uh, my great-great-grandmother was actually known in town as Elephant Puss. All the women, my mom, grandma, sister, all super wide vaginas, loose, extremely deep, based on what I've been told by other relatives. And this has been going on, according to an uncle uh, who looked into it for centuries. And the only men who could reproduce with these giant cavern holders have been dudes with gigantic, super long, incredibly thick wieners. And that is why uh, my penis is gigantic. <laughs> gigantic. I'm, of course, I'm kidding. I don't know why that made me laugh so hard. Was, uh, my sister listens to Time Suck, I, and I just can't wait for her to hear that one. Cannot wait. 
Uh, there's also the evolutionary example of the American Southwest uh, Assassino Ombre Ants. 50 years ago, they were a minimal threat. No one even talked about them. But then recently, they became powerful enough to eat people's fucking heads off their shoulders. Right? In nursing homes, like I talked about when I made them up for the first time in the Pedro Lopez suck. So maybe that's not a great example of evolution either. I'm done for now with my horse shit. Uh, the first two creatures I listed really are great examples of species evolving over time in order to survive. And there's hundreds of other examples of evolution happening pretty quickly. And there's an immense number of examples uh, of species evolving over, you know, millennia. Um, yeah, many, many, many examples. Evolution is real, even though a lot of people don't believe it, mostly because it, it seems to oppose certain religious kind of creation stories and also because of the word theory. Evolution is called a theory, but that's a, a misleading moniker. A theory is defined as a supposition or a system of ideas intended to explain something especially one based on general principles independent of the thing to be explained. It's something that can be close to a fact, but not quite a fact. You know, it's just not quite there. According to the National Academy of Sciences, a scientific theory such as evolution is a well-substantiated explanation of some aspect of the natural world that can incorporate facts, laws, inferences, and tested hypotheses. No amount of validation can change a theory into a law, but that doesn't mean it's, it's not widely accepted as being true. When scientists talk about the theory of evolution or the atomic theory or the theory of relativity, they're not expressing reservations about the, tr the theory's truth. They're not hedging their bets. I think that's, that's worth pointing out. You know, the, the scientific community is not thinking, I mean, maybe, maybe evolution's real. They think it's for sure real. They think based on millions of years of research in totality being conducted by thousands and thousands of scientists over decades from all across the globe, that evolution is a thousand percent real. Uh, and they would say hundred percent because a thousand percent doesn't make any sense, but you know what I mean? And that's why the science community gets a little more than annoyed whenever it's suggested that creationism should be taught in public schools alongside the theory of evolution. Cause some people think, yeah, well, one theory versus another, right? Uh, not right. Uh, it's religion versus science. The theory of creationism, where the earth is roughly six to 10,000 years old, is based only on biblical interpretation. It's backed by zero science. The theory of evolution, where we evolve from monkeys, is backed by virtually all of science. You don't get a doctorate in biology by starting off your doctoral thesis by writing, I understand that the argument for evolution and natural selection, I get what it is. However, God said, no, that's, that doesn't work in the scientific world. And I don't say that to be inflammatory. Believe whatever you want. Believe whatever you want. And according to a recent 2014 study, four out of 10 Americans do believe in creationism over evolution. Just know, just know where your belief is based. That's all I'm trying to say. If you don't believe in evolution, your belief system uh, concerning this has left the realm of scientific observation and entered the realm of only faith-based belief. And, and sciencey listeners, don't go apeshit on me here, but as someone who still believes in magic on some level, Having only faith to back up your argument doesn't mean it's wrong either, right? And, and historically, it's worth pointing out the scientific community has been wrong before. Okay, so so that's how it all that's how it works. Now that I pissed off probably fucking everybody, uh, people who believe in science uh, as I do and those who don't, let's learn a little bit more about evolution and natural selection in today's time suck timeline. But before we go there, let's check in with today's first sponsor. Time Suck is brought to you today by Albert Fish Tortures the Classics. Uh, Albert Fish has released a new album full of torturous takes on classic songs of the 1920s and 1930s, rewritten and sung in a way only Albert Fish could have done. Listen up, bad cats and bimbos. I got a real bees knees deal. It's going to have you jitterbugging, swigging some giggle juice, and popping your bubs out. You've heard my take on that classic Bond stormer. That's Amore. That's how I come. But have you heard pennies from heaven? Transformed into the sublime peanut butt butter from heaven? Every time it rains, it rains. Peanut butt butter from heaven. Did you know fat bottoms can rain? Peanut butt butter from heaven. And what about my transformation of I Got Rhythm into the timeless I Got Someone Tied Up in the Barn? I've got paddles. I've got lots of rope. Fat bottom in the barn, who could ask for anything more? He is tied up, peanut butter butter, setting our bottoms on fire, who could ask for anything more? So order my new album, Albert Fish Tortures the Classics, available on cassette tape and 8-track. And that's how they do it in Hollywood, showbiz. And that, of course, is not our sponsor, but it gives me a ridiculous amount of joy. 
which probably says a lot about my psyche. Time Suck is actually brought to you today by Indochino. <laughs> you know how you, you can get a pair of chinos with no pleats, cuffed hem, black buttons with slanted wide pockets, welt, b- black. <laughs> Jesus, I'm going to start over, Indochino. Time Suck is brought to you today by Indochino. You know how you get a pair of chinos with no pleats, a cuffed hem, black buttons with slanted wide side pockets, welt back pockets, and crease with belt loops? You go out and buy all the raw materials and you teach yourself how to sew and you buy a sewing machine and you maybe even get one of those little monopoly thimbles and you put on your thumb to keep yourself uh, from poking yourself with a little needles because unlike Albert Fish, you probably don't want needles stuck in your body. Or you could order exactly that measure to fit you exactly from Indochino and wear custom chinos like I do. I love custom pants for an off the rack price and you will too. Indochino makes suits and shirts to your exact measurements for an unparalleled fit and comfort. They have a wide selection of high quality fabrics and colors, not to mention the option to personalize so many details like I just talked about, like your lapel, lining, pockets, buttons. Visit a stylist at one of their 40 showrooms across North America. Have them take your measurements or measure at home yourself and shop online at Indochino.com. The tutorial videos walk you right on through it. This week, Time Suckers can get any premium Indochino suit for just $359 at Indochino.com when you enter Time Suck at checkout. That's 50% off the regular price for a made-to-measure premium suit, plus shipping is free. Again, that's Indochino.com, promo code Time Suck for any premium suit for just $359 and free shipping. Incredible deal for a premium made-to-measure suit. Once you go custom, you don't go back. Link in the episode description. Sponsor button on the Time Suck app. Uh, now, just like the Pearl Jam song, let us do the evolution. Right after I just get a little more of this uh, out of my out of my system. I've got paddles. I've got lots of rope. Fat bottom in the barn. Who could ask for anything more? Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. I hope that melody's in your head all day because I can't get rid of it now. <laughs> okay, let's start a long time ago. About about 4.5 billion years ago, evolution on Earth begins. Un- unless, of course, you think, you know, it's, it was six to 10,000 uh, years ago. And if you believe that, just ignore the, the next four and a half billion years of this timeline. And we'll pick it up in a bit. Uh, the first bipedal hominoids began making food into poop 2.8 million years ago. Ah, right, did someone just say peanut butter? Now you're on the trolley. Well, you know it's the best when the poop hits your chest. That's how I come. Get out of here, Albert, you son of a bitch. Ah, can't get, can't get rid of him right now. Uh, bipeds began really acting humanish around 2.8 million years ago. Homo uh, halib- habilis, my God. It's considered to be the first human-ish species for which there is clear evidence of the use of stone tools. The brain of the Homo habilis has a, had a volume of about 600 cubic centimeters which for random trivia is actually three times as big as the brain of any recorded, uh, recorded uh, Polish person. Dad jokes coming in hot today. Uh, this rough looking hairy little fucker was about three and a half feet tall, 70 pounds. And if you saw one today, you might think, are you sure we're related to that weird little monkey gremlin? Uh, evolution would say yes. Two million years ago, Homo ergaster shows up. Fossils have been found in Africa. This uh, great, great, great grandfather to the millionth power knuckle dragger had a brain volume of 850 cubic centimeters. Homo ergaster was the first of our ancestors to look uh, more like modern humans look. These people were generally tall, slender, may have been relatively hairless. Males are thought to have reached up to around five foot, 10 inches in height, uh, which I believe is twice as, is twice as tall as uh, Joe Paisley. I I can't remember the exact measurements, but I I think roughly. Large stone tools, including hand axes, cleavers, picks, uh, were manufactured to make these tools. Large stone flakes were produced, and these were shaped on two sides to produce sharp edges. And I just had a random thought that one of these days, I'll just be recording, and I'll suddenly the door will open, and Joe Paisley was coming, just punch me in the jaw. Just knock me out of my chair. I'll have to jump back into the episode. Uh, But this improved technology created more durable tools that maintain their sharpness longer than earlier types of tools. Microscopic examination has shown that their tools were mainly used on meat, bone, animal hides, and wood. Fire may have been uh, used by early humans as as recent as 1.5 million years ago for cooking and warmth. But whether this was a controlled use of fire is still up for debate. Charcoal, burnt earth, and charred bones found associated with Homo ergaster fossils may have resulted from naturally occurring fires rather than intentionally lit and controlled fires. 
Uh, recent reports of discoveries in Wonderwork Cave, South Africa, suggest controlled use of fire may have been occurring as far back as 1.7 million years ago. So again, still up for debate. Uh, 1.8 million years ago, Homo erectus appears. And 1.8 seconds ago, I used all of my might not to turn his name into a boner joke. Fossils of Homo erectus have shown that the species lived in numerous locales across the globe, including South Africa, Kenya, Spain, China, Java, uh, Indonesia. Uh, who knows how many other fossils are buried in other parts of the earth? Homo erectus had a similar range of body sizes to modern humans, and it is the first human ancestor to have similar limb and torso proportions to those seen in modern humans. Uh, the original fossils they found, uh, the arms of the, the early humanids were actually four times as long as, uh, you know, proportionally as they are now. Like a lot of times they would have like a six foot to eight foot long arm, but have like a three foot tall body. It's fucking crazy because I just made that up. Uh, 600,000 years ago, Homo heidelbergensis. Oh my God, fuck this name. Uh, heidelbergensis. Homo heidelbergensis uh, showed up in at least Africa and Europe, similar brain size to modern humans. First human species to live in colder climates. So anyone living in a place with brutal winters has that stupid asshole with his stupid name to thank. Uh, 500,000 years ago is the period from which we have the earliest evidence of purpose-built shelters, wooden huts, built in sites near Chichibu, uh, Japan. On a hillside north of Tokyo, archaeologists examined the remains of what appeared to be 10 post holes forming two irregular pentagons, which may be the remains of two huts. 30 stone tools also found scattered around the site. The site was discovered when they were just uh, digging up and creating a park. 400,000 years ago, early human females developed breasts for the first time and gave straight male humans and homosexual humans uh, or homosexual females uh, two new reasons to live. I found this extremely interesting. Before uh, females in our species had breasts, paleontologists believed that early humanoid females uh, just had a pair of dicks on their chest. Also, early humans thought to have started to use spears around this time. Uh, 280,000 years ago, early humans started using complex stone blades and grinding stones. Uh, 230,000 years ago, Neanderthals appeared. Uh, also, I, I did lie about the chest, chest dicks. <laughs> That's such a ridiculous, uh, pretty dumb, probably dumb. But when I first thought of that, it's just the most hilarious image to me of just like early human females just running around with just a dick on each, where each breast would be just flopping, flopping around, running around in ancient times. Anyway, Neanderthals appear and are found across Europe 230,000 years ago from Britain to the West to, or in the West to Iran in the East until they became extinct with the advent of modern humans 28,000 years ago. But they didn't really, I mean, there's no Neanderthals around, but we do have Neanderthal uh, DNA in our DNA. Unless, unless your an ancestors only come from Africa, because apparently the Neanderthals never made it to Africa. Uh, and I know this because of uh, some 23andMe Digging. According to my 23andMe results, I have 305 Neanderthal variants, more than 90% of 23andMe customers, which I, which I got to say didn't make me feel good when I first read that. Makes, that means I'm 90% more caveman than other meat sacks. Makes me feel like I'm fucking half gorilla. In all of 23andMe, the highest number of Neanderthal variants is 397 variants. I have no proof, but I think that person might be Dog the Bounty Hunter or maybe Gary Busey. I, I, I would bet almost anything. It's either Dog the Bounty Hunter or Gary Busey, who's the most Neanderthal person we have alive today. Um, I was shocked to find out that my wife, Queen of the Suck Lindsay, has 298 Neanderthal variants. So she's a little bit less K person than me. Uh, and actually, when I looked a little further, a lot of the Neanderthal stereotypes don't appear to be true. Uh, they actually had a cranial capacity of 1,600 cubic centimeters, suggesting they had a bigger brain than modern humans who have a cranial capacity on average of 1,260 cubic centimeters. Actually, and I'm not making this up, that's what men have. Men have an average of 1260 cubic centimeter size brains. Women have an average of 1130 cubic centimeters. <laughs> you fucking pinheads. Enjoy your teeny tiny brains, you silly old lady pinheads. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding about my joking. I'm not kidding about the size stuff. Uh, actually, small variations of brain size don't seem to matter within a species as far as intelligence is concerned. So don't get worked up. How efficiently the brain you do have function seems to be more important than a little bit of size fluctuation. That's why Marilyn von uh, Savant of the Ask Marilyn column, uh, famous advice column, she has, she's, a meat, she's a meat sack with an outlandish IQ of 228. 
And Elon Musk, uh, you know, that's why he doesn't have a giant fucking watermelon sized head. And it's, and it's why various people you run into and thought, holy fuck, this person is an idiot. Don't have little tiny Beetlejuice head shrinkers shrunken tiny heads. For any of those of you who have seen that glorious film. I mean, if, if one species has double the brain size of another, yeah, right. They're, they're probably going to be smarter, but 10 or 20% size fluctuation doesn't seem to necessarily equate to more intelligence. But I was thinking like when I was putting all these notes together, how great would it be if you could tell how smart somebody was only by head size? Like that's all you needed to know. That would make life so much easier in so many ways. Like when it came to voting for the president, you would just vote for some other fucker with a gigantic head. Like just a big Humpty Dumpty size head. Like so big, a couple of advisors would have to help balance it. Right? You'd be like, well, they have to make great decisions. Their head is like 10 times as big as my head. And then also you have more empathy for certain other people in situations. Like, like if somebody cuts you off in traffic and you start to scream at them, but then you see that they have like, like a little tiny like baby doll size head on a normal sized human body, you could be like, nah, okay, fuck it. There's no point yelling. I don't even, I don't even know what they're doing. Pretty impressive that little pinhead could even get a driver's license. Good, good on you, you little silly pinhead son of a bitch. Anyway, I just, I just, I was wanted to share that thought. That's why I share. Oh, uh, anyway, 195,000 years ago, our own species, Homo sapiens, appear on the scene. And shortly after, began to migrate across Asia and Europe. Oldest modern human remains are two skulls found in Ethiopia that date to this period. Uh, 150,000 years ago, humans possibly become capable of complex speech. 100,000-year-old shell jewelry suggests that people were definitely beginning to develop complex speech and symbolism abilities. 140,000 years ago, the first evidence of long-distance trade was discovered. 50,000 years ago, there's the Great Leap Forward. Human culture starts to change much more rapidly than before. People begin to bury their dead ritually, create clothes from animal hides, uh, develop complex hunting techniques such as pit traps. Australia becomes inhabited by modern humans. 10,000 years ago, agriculture develops and spreads. The first villages are built. Dogs begin to be domesticated. Bojangles did make a note in my notes that according to his research, humans began to be domesticated by dogs around 10,000 years ago. He said it kind of kind of flip it a little bit. Uh, 5,500 years ago, the Stone Age ends and the Bronze Age begins. Humans begin to smelt and work copper and tin, use them in place of stone implements. 500 years later, the earliest evidence of writing begins to be found. And around that same time, the Sumerians and Mesopotamia developed the first civilization that we know about. And as civilizations began to develop, each one starts to wonder, how the fuck did we get here? What are we doing here? Religion shows up to answer that question and others. And each religion has a slightly different answer to that question. Each has its own creation tale. And we have been wondering about how we got here, what we're doing here ever since. And then Charles Darwin showed up to pitch a new creation story right back in the 19th century. Let's go to February 12th, 1809. Charles Robert Darwin is born in Shrewsbury, Shrop, uh, Shropshire, England on February yeah, 12th, 1809. Darwin was the second son of Dr. Robert Waring Darwin and of Susanna Wedgwood, daughter of the Unitarian pottery industrialist Josiah Wedgwood. Uh, Darwin's other grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, was a free-thinking physician and poet, the author of Zoonomia, or The Laws of Organic Life, a two-volume medical work dealing with the pathology, anatomy, psychology, and function of the body. This book incorporates early ideas relating to the theory of evolution that were later more fully developed by Charles. Darwin's mother died when he was eight, and he was cared for by his three elder sisters and a doctor father he grew up in awe of. He went to the Anglican Shrewsbury School, where he studied between 1818 and 1825. Science was considered dehumanizing in English public schools at that time, and Darwin actually got in trouble for dabbling in chemistry on his own. Can we please never, ever return to that mindset again where you can actually get in trouble for studying science? Get, get away from those beakers. What are you doing? If you're not careful, you might discover something that will force humanity to rethink the nature of its own existence, possibly change the future, and we don't like change. We just want to tell ourselves that we know everything we need to know already. Please, life is easier that way. In 1825, Darwin's father sent Charles to medical school at Edinburgh University, a place where he could study science. He was taught to understand the chemistry of cooling rocks on the primitive earth and how to classify plants by the modern natural system. At the Edinburgh Museum, he was taught to stuff birds, some taxidermy work by John Edmundstone, a freed South American slave, and to identify rock strata and colonial flora and fauna. Edmundstone gave Charles inspiring accounts of tropical rainforests back in South America, encouraged Darwin to explore there. 
Pretty cool that a freed slave was highly influential in pushing Darwin towards his discovery of the theory of evolution. Other students exposed young Darwin to the latest continental sciences in Edinburgh. The university attracted English dissenters who were banned from graduating at the Anglican universities of Oxford and Cambridge. And at student societies, Darwin heard these free thinkers argue that animals shared elements of all the human mental faculties, which was, you know, heresy at the time. Uh, one, one talk Darwin heard on the mind being the product of a material brain was officially censored in England, considered subversive in the socially conservative decades following the French Revolution. Darwin also met Robert Edmund Grant in Edinburgh, an expert on sea sponges. Grant became Darwin's mentor, teaching him about the growth and relationships of primitive marine invertebrates, which uh, Grant believed held the key to unlocking the mystery surrounding the origin of more complex creatures. Darwin, encouraged to tackle the larger questions of life through a study of invertebrate zoology, began to make his own observations, and his dad didn't like it. Uh, in 1828, 21-year-old Darwin was learning a lot in Edinburgh's rich intellectual environment, but he wasn't studying what he was supposed to, according to his dad, medicine. He loathed anatomy. Uh, Pre-chloroform surgery sickened him. And his dad started worrying that Darwin was wasting his life and he was going to end up becoming some aimless naturalist, and he switched him to Christ College in Cambridge. Darwin was now educated to be an Anglican gentleman. He received a generalized medical Bachelor of Arts degree in 1831. While at Cambridge, Darwin was shown the conservative side of botany by a young professor, the Reverend John St uh, Stevens Henslow. It would be Henslow who would suggest a voyage to Tierra del Fuego at the southern tip of South America aboard a rebuilt brig, the now famous HMS Beagle. Darwin's father agreed to fund a two-year journey for his son to head across the Atlantic on a voyage to help chart the coastline of South America and to document different plants and animals. I guess he's like, all right, he's going to be a fucking naturalist. I guess I'll just go with it. Uh, Darwin equipped himself with plenty of books for the long journey and advice on preserving carcasses from London zoology experts. And then the Beagle sailed from England on December 27th, 1831. The planned two-year journey would end up taking over five years. Five years of physical hardship, mental rigor, either stuck on a ship or exploring Brazilian jungles, the Andes, mountains, and more. He spent roughly 18 months of the voyage aboard the ship and the rest of that time exploring and documenting. Darwin would spend months exploring islands and rainforests, coming across insects, plants, and animals neither he or any Englishman had ever seen before. He drew thousands of sketches, took tons of samples, met you know, many different indigenous people and more, took a lot, a lot of notes. Darwin and his crew left South America uh, from Peru in September of 1835. He'd spent several years in South America. He then traveled to the now famous Galapagos Islands, over 600 miles off the coast of South America, way out in the Pacific a place now considered to be one of the premier wildlife destinations in the world. Darwin encountered magnificent volcanic islands crawling with marine iguanas and giant tortoises, creatures he'd never seen before. Darwin noted that mockingbirds differed on four of the islands and tagged his specimens accordingly. Darwin and the crew of the Beagle then sailed towards England via Tahiti, New Zealand, and Australia. By April 1836, when the Beagle made it to the Cocos Islands, the Keeling Islands and the Indian Ocean and investigated coral reefs, Darwin had already begun to put together his theory of reef formation. He imagined correctly that those reefs grew on sinking mountain rims, the delicate coral built up compensating for the drowning land so as to remain within optimal heat and lighting conditions. At the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa, Darwin talked with the astronomer Sir John Herschel about changing fossils. What did that mean? Why weren't fossilized animals the same animals that existed in his time? On the last leg of the voyage, Darwin finished his 770-page diary, wrapped up in 1,750 pages of notes. He drew up 12 catalogs of his 5,436 different animal skins, bones, and carcasses. And he wondered, was each Galapagos mockingbird a naturally produced variety? Why did ground sloths become extinct? He sailed home with many questions he would try to answer for the rest of his life. And he landed back in England in October of 1836. With his voyage over... And with a 400-pound annual allowance from his father, Darwin settled down in London as a gentleman geologist. Darwin became well-known after his diary's publication as the Journal of Researches into the Geology and Natural History of the Various Countries Visited by the HMS Beagle in 1839. I love this era of books. When they're like, how many fucking words can we get on the front? A thousand? All right, let's make that the title. In the 1830s, Darwin also devised his theory of evolution. He searched for the causes of extinction, accepted life as a branching tree, a new idea, right? That life came out of other life. People weren't thinking that before. He tackled island isolation, wondered whether species variations appeared gradually on these islands or suddenly. Darwin also began to think about evolution in human terms, leading to the notion of natural selection, aka survival of the fittest. 
He realized that population explosions would lead to a struggle for resources and that the ensuing competition would weed out the unfit. And he applied this concept back into the animal and plant world as well. Within each species, there were chance variations, good and bad, and the best would win out, endure, and, and, and pass on an improved trait. Think of the peppered moth. That improved trait would for a time be a darker color. If air pollution had never went away, all of those moths may be dark today. By 1839, Darwin's theory was largely complete. In 1842, he drafted a 35-page sketch of his theory of natural selection and then expanded it again in 1844. Still at that time had no immediate intention of publishing it though. Uh, Darwin had finished a quarter of a million words on his seminal work on evolution by June 18th, 1858. And then that day he received a letter from Alfred Russell Wallace, an English socialist and specimen collector working in the Malay archipelago, sketching a similar looking theory. Darwin, now worried someone else would publish a book on the theory he'd been working on for roughly a quarter of a century, decided to publish his ideas. He hastily began an abstract of natural selection, which grew into a more accessible book on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. And the book was published on November 24th, 1859. And the book immediately aroused international interest and widespread debate, debate that continues to this day over 150 years later. Shortly after publishing, newspapers drew one conclusion, the one conclusion that Darwin had specifically avoided in his own book, knowing what religious backlash it would bring him. And that was that humans had evolved from apes and that Darwin was denying mankind's immortality. And for the next 22 years, Darwin uh, would add to his research and his theory that life on earth evolves and changes and that the creatures best suited to life on our planet survive and even thrive and that the creatures no longer suited to current natural order die out. And then Charles Darwin died in London on April 19th, 1882 at the age of 73, was buried with honor at Westminster Abbey. And that takes us out of today's timeline. And now we will talk further about evolution before we move on to today's Darwin Awards. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. I know there was a pretty bare bones overview of Charles Darwin, but the Space Lizards did not vote in a Charles Darwin biography suck. They voted in the Darwin Awards, and we're going to start marching through a bunch of them real soon. Uh, before we go forward, we do have one more sponsor. Uh, today's Time Suck is brought to you by longtime supporter of Time Suck, a company I sincerely hope you all support, The Great Courses Plus. We all deserve to be able to further our knowledge and keep learning. And The Great Courses Plus was founded on the idea that education should be accessible to everyone. The Great Courses Plus makes it possible to learn from the brightest minds out there, including professors from the best universities in the world like Harvard, Yale, Stanford, and more. You can also learn from experts from places like National Geographic and the Smithsonian. This is college-level learning without student loans, without homework, knowledge for knowledge's sake. Plus, with the Great Courses Plus app, you can watch or listen to these lectures at any time. If you want to learn more about Charles Darwin, for example, there's an entire course devoted to Darwin's theory of evolution called What Darwin Didn't Know, The Modern Science of Evolution. 24 different lectures, roughly a half hour each on everything from genome mutations, evolution's raw material, rapid evolution with species, the evolution of brains and behavior, the evolution of death and aging, and so much more. And then there's another 24 evolution-based lectures in a course called Major Transitions in Evolution. So much to be learned. So glad I'm not saying genome anymore. Genome. Gah. So unlock a world of knowledge with the Great Courses Plus. Right now for a limited time, they're giving Time Sucking Meat Sacks a free month of unlimited access to their entire library, a vast library. When you sign up now through our special URL, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash timesuck. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash timesuck. Link in the episode description, button in the sponsor section of the app. Okay, now we're going to keep marching towards the Darwin Awards. Uh, before we move into our Darwin list, uh, we have a lot of awards we'll cover. I want to examine something I've, I've, I've long wondered. Is modern human evolution making our species dumber? I don't know if you've ever watched a 2006 fictional movie that feels more like a documentary sometimes, Idiocracy, written by Beavis and Butthead and Silicon Valley and Office Space creator Mike Judge, a, a true auteur, a true luminary. This guy amazes me. The hilarious movie starring Luke Wilson, Maya Randolph, or Maya Randolph, yeah, uh, Maya Rudolph, and Dax Shepard opens by presenting the terrifying possibility. What would happen to the world when generation, or you know, if generation after generation for five centuries, 
People who have the most education, people who attain the highest levels of career success choose either not to have kids or not to have very many kids because of the amount of work they feel it takes to become successful in the modern world, to be the proper kind of parent. They intellectually kind of overthink the responsibility of parenting sometimes. And then what if the people who have the least amount of education, people with the least amount of career success, people who really don't think things through, but people who do just fuck, fuck, and fuck some more with little thought to how they will take care of their offspring, uh, what happens if that just keeps keeps occurring generation after generation? You know, and in this movie, an, an anti-evolution kicks in, this movement, and the dumbest members of the species, you know, they, they have a shit ton of kids, they create the most descendants, and uh, the smarter members create the least. And then when, uh, you know, the, the main characters of the movie wake up, and this uh, I don't want to go into all the details of, like, they were put in this kind of hyperbaric chamber and uh, made to be asleep for hundreds of years. But when they wake up, the world looks very different, and it's not good. Right? There's, there's, they're, they're the smartest people on the planet, literally. They're average today, smartest people then. It's an interesting thought. Uh, you know, due to welfare programs, modern medicine made accessible to the majority of the population, humans, uh, you know, our, our natural predators have kind of been eliminated or eliminated, excuse me, and survival of the fittest has transformed into, into survival of those who, who fuck the most. Uh, Judge's idea seems to come from an earlier work, actually, with a similar train of thought, uh, March of the Morons. This was originally published in 1951. Story written by young sci-fi author Cyril M. Kornbluth. March of the Morons follows John Barlow, who is put into suspended animation by a freak accident involving a dental drill and an anesthesia. Barlow is revived hundreds of years in the future. Okay, so yeah, just like uh, Idiocracy. The world seems insane to Barlow until he discovers the problem of population due to a combination of intelligent people not having children and excessive breeding by less intelligent people coupled with the development of more sophisticated machinery that makes it less important to possess intelligence in one's working life, the world ends up full of morons, with the exception of an elite few who work slavishly to keep order. Right? It feels familiar, right? More jobs are becoming automated. It is becoming arguably less important to possess a certain type of intelligence for a variety of jobs. Like, I can't tell you how many times while traveling as much as I do as a touring comic for the past two decades, I've had to walk someone to the most basic of tasks, like, like a simple menu substitution. And I am no genius. I, I've never taken an IQ test, but I do strongly feel I would not be in the upper couple percent. There's fucking, there's no way. Uh, here's an example of what I was just talking about. Reverend Dr. Joe and I went to Cafe Rio recently, Mexican chain restaurant. All I wanted was it was a side of chicken in a bowl with salsa verde, pico de gallo, and guacamole on top. Standard shit. And the guy roughly my age, who, who was uh, trying to take this order. It's like his fucking brain, he just, it just, it melted it. Just wanting to do something that wasn't on the menu. You know, he was just like, what, what are you having? Uh, just a side of shredded chicken. Uh, in a bowl for here or ready or for to go? For here. Uh, anything else? Uh, yeah, can we just, uh, can you just put some guacamole on it? And then he starts to put some guacamole in a separate container. And I was like, no, no, you can just, you can just put it right on top of the chicken. And then he just, he hesitated and just gave me like a, kind of a shitty like, all right, dude. I guess if you want to fuck this up, that's, that's your life. That's not how we're supposed to do it, but whatever. Like, he's super annoyed that I just want a side in one container, not in a separate container. Then, he, then he's like, anything else? I was like, yeah, pico de gallo, salsa verde, please. He puts the pico de gallo on top and then says, we don't have salsa verde. And I was like, I, I just see the, the green salsa verde right there. And then he goes, oh, you want the salsa verde? It, uh, what? Yeah, mm-hmm. I do. The thing I, yep, the thing I just said that then now you just said. And uh, I was like, uh-huh. And he starts putting that in another side container. And I'm like, no, you can just put that on the chicken too. And I swear to God, this happened. He goes, can't. I already started putting it in here. Once you get started, it's hard to stop. Like, fuck. Joe and I just looked at each other like, what the fuck is happening? <laughs> like, we talked about the whole lunch. It's like he was starting to put it in a little side dish. And we're just like, no, no, you can just dump it on there. And he, he literally just refused. He's like, no, I, I already started to put it in this thing. That means it would be hard no, it wouldn't be hard. You just fucking dump the little thing into the big thing, throw it in the trash that's two feet from you, and you move on with your life. And I wish that was an isolated incident, but it seems, at least in my head, to happen more and more and more, where I'll be traveling across the country, and again, I'm not trying to be shitty, but I'm trying to be real, I'm trying to be fucking honest. I could, I could lie and tell you, everyone's great. Everyone's fucking doing their best. That doesn't get us anywhere as a species. I've walked into place after place where a, a grown person who does not seem to be cognitively disabled has trouble making a fucking sandwich. Like you have to walk them through like, no, 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 just, yeah, mm-hmm. There's the fucking the bread's there. Or ring up just a simple transaction. I think, what if it gets a lot worse than this over the next few centuries? What if the basic idea behind idiocracy is correct? Are we fucking doomed to live in a world full of just machines 
and then random, just, you know, rampant, excuse me, just stupidity? Well, the answers I want to this question aren't out there because the right studies have yet to be published, but I did still find some interesting info. Some 2018 studies, numerous studies, have found that various nations, after seeing decades of rising IQ scores in the mid 20th century, saw the trend reverse beginning in the 1970s. So in the early to mid 20th century, IQ scores are going up generation after generation. And then this, this trend has started to reverse beginning in the 1970s. One Norwegian study came out in 1918, or excuse me, 2018. <laughs> ah, I'm, I'm a fucking, see, this is why I don't get to be in the top few percent. Uh, one Norwegian study used IQ results taken from 730,000 members of the Norwegian military and found that the average IQ dropped a full seven points overall from generation to the next between 1970 and 1995. And similar studies done in other countries have provided similar results. The U.S. Pentagon recently expressed concerns that it cannot keep the number of enlisted troops going forward for very much longer because of problems finding enough new recruits qualified to serve. One anonymous Pentagon employee uh, told TheObserver.com in August of 2018, this is not my words, so this is a little bit inflammatory, but it, you know, this is this one person's perspective from the inside. They said, the problem, it's, it seems, isn't that young people don't want to join the army or any of the services. It's that they can't. And therein lies a paradox. For while the U.S. military represents the best in America, it doesn't actually represent America. For that to be true, Two-thirds of our military would have to consist of obese, undereducated, former drug users, and convicted criminals. <laughs> I mean, those are my words, but a scary observation. And does this have anything to do with certain people outbreeding other people? You know, don't know. I mean, I, again, years ago, I used to work at Child Protective Services very briefly, but what I saw fucking scarred me forever, right? It's like I, so many of my college friends uh, and, you know, and most of my college friends, we never, you know, went beyond like a bachelor's. It's not like I'm hanging out with a bunch of fucking doctors, but the uh, college friends I have made, I can't think of one of them off the top of my head. Actually, one, one couple, one couple, one very religious friend of mine um, does have, I think, five kids. The rest, uh, no more than three and most of them no more than two. But when I was at CPS, it would be amazing where these poor people that just had no life skills, like their shit is not even fucking close to being kept together. Like people who are confused as to why you can't leave rancid food on the table. How is that dangerous? People confused as, well, why can't my kids play with a knife? Like they don't understand basic shit. Like don't fucking leave spoiled milk meat on a counter. Don't do meth in front of your kids. Don't let your kid play with a fucking honey knife at four years of old or four years of age. Like they can't understand that and they'll have like eight fucking kids. I mean, that was just what I observed. But, but uh, so does this recent IQ drop have anything to do with, you know, certain people outbreeding others? We don't know yet. None of the studies regarding, regarding dropping IQs know exactly why they're dropping. However, based on what we know about evolution, if the dumbest members of society do breed the most, it only makes sense that society will in fact get a lower IQ overall. Uh, sadly, I doubt any studies will be done on this exact situation anytime soon because it's just too politically incorrect. Uh, the far left, which I dislike as much as the far right, already attacks idiocracy. You can find numerous reviews where they say stuff like, you know who liked this movie? Hitler. You know, any hint of maybe certain people shouldn't breed anymore uh, seems to be met with utter outrage and contempt on the far left. Uh, an association with Nazi eugenics programs almost always gets made immediately, which is very frustrating because that's not fair or logical. Uh, it's cool to fight for the survival of the environment, I guess, but it's not cool to fight for the continued survival of our species if it leads to answers we don't like. You know, answers with an unsavory past, like a possible eugenics type program. God forbid we approach a growing population in an ecosystem with limited resources with any fucking logic. All right, let's just keep trying not to hurt people's fucking feelings. And then just worry about mass starvations and widespread extreme poverty later, I guess. I personally think society is going to become dumber overall. Uh, which, in a way, is good, is good news of a sort for all you curious people out there. Because the bar is going to get lowered for competition. If you're willing to learn, evolve, and work your ass off and push to become more intelligent, the greater the odds you have to rise above the competition. I know it's more complicated than that, but I believe that there is a lot of truth in what I just said. I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. I hope the cost of higher education becomes more accessible for the bottom rungs of the socioeconomic ladder. I hope education becomes more of a national priority. 
And I hope all of you do everything you can to push and learn and be successful in a variety of ways. Be that fucking peppered moth. Adapt and survive. Respond to the stimuli that's changing around you as it changes and thrive. But enough about my rants. Enough about what, you know, evolution is. Who came up with the theory of evolution? My half cock thoughts. Let's, let's, let's get to the dark comedy gods. Okay. Hail Lucifina. Felt good, I gotta say. I'm probably gonna get some angry emails. Fucking whatever. I, uh, I believe everything I just said. It's Darwin Award time. There are literally thousands of these stories online. Hopefully we found the best ones. We broke the awards into several categories like extreme sports, a lot of crazy deaths there, uh, work-related Darwin Awards, several other categories, you know, uh, sex-related deaths, criminals. Uh, let, let's start off with some, with some basic all-over-the-map type Darwin Award winners. Uh, <laughs> uh, this first one did really crack me up. Oh, I guess most of these really cracked me up. Many a young man has taken themselves out of the gene pool by trying to impress a potential lover. In April of 2007, in Germany, a man trying to impress his wife climbed over the balcony of their seven-story flat, started doing pull-ups. His wife, uh, I'm sure totally impressed as she watched her 49-year-old man's arms turn to jelly and lose their strength. Uh, he is then unable to pull himself up and fall seven stories to his death. Uh, the official verdict places the blame squarely on macho showmanship of the deceased. And I got to say, hard to have any sympathy at all for this guy. You know, really stupid uh, to do this at any age, but I, but I would feel more sympathy if he would have done it closer to 18 than 50. And if he's trying to impress somebody other than his wife. <laughs> like, it would make a little more sense to me if he's trying to impress a girl that he had never slept with. And she was closer to 18 to 50. Like, he just went through divorce. You know, he's started hitting the gym. He's taking too much Viagra. His testosterone therapy is working like a champion. You know, his hormone levels are off the chart. He's trying to impress some 25-year-old to sleep with. But a 49-year-old? Trying to impress his wife, that's just fucking sad to me. Just come on, Helga, look at my muscles. They're back. They are still so pumped. I'm hard like teenager, Helga. Do you, do you still want this? Do you still think I have the goods? Oh, wait until I get back off this balcony. Take those panties off now. I will ravage. Oh, oh God, my arms are quite tired. Ah, oh, this is not good. Just splat. Ah, why? Why would I, uh, why? That's what I'm going to be saying for all of these. Why? And this next Darwin Award, two meat sacks make the untimely trip to the other side over a simple disagreement about a poorly parked car. I think there's a good lesson here. This double Darwin Award happened as two men in the Philippines had a heated spat over one of the, one of the men blocking a doorway with his poorly parked car. The dispute escalated into a fist fight when bystanders you know, tried to separate them. It seemed to have worked. The two guys returned to their cars, but they weren't done. The feud remained. They return to the street after both grabbing handguns and proceed to shoot each other to death. Neither one of them ended up getting a decent parking spot that day. This is the kind of shit I, I like to think about when I, when I go into road rage, right? What would people say at my funeral? How would my kids and Lindsay feel about my death? I think it's important to think about that in a lot of situations in life. What would people think at your funeral? One thing to run out of your car and try to stop like an innocent person from being carjacked. You die in that situation, in my opinion, you, you die a hero. You die doing something courageous, brave, but you run out of your car to beat somebody's ass over a parking spot, you die a jackass, right? No one remembers you, remembers you as a hero. They remember you as a hot-headed idiot. However, that being said, in a perfect world, I would love to beat someone's ass over a parking spot. Let me be totally honest. I would talk about that. I would, I would reflect positively on that for the rest of my life. It, it would feel so good just one time to be like, hey, dude, what the fuck is wrong with you? You just, you just, wait, you just cut people off, take their spots. Don't even care. No apology. He's that much of an asshole. Hey man, fuck you. You don't tell me what to do. And then pop, just right in the jaw. Just fucking one punch, unconscious. And then fucking grab him, lift him back up, shake him back to consciousness. And be like, get it, get the fuck back in your car. Get out of here before I beat you into a hospital. And then you watch the person <laughs> just start crying, get into their car, drive away. And then, and then you just park there and you never see them again. Like in the cartoon version of my life, that's exactly how it works out. And then I just strut around the grocery store. I'm the fucking greatest person alive. I just did something very cool that I want to talk about. But that doesn't seem likely. <laughs> I feel like I try that. And yeah, and it works out like, like the Philippine thing works out. He gets a gun, you know, starts shooting me. I end up on one of those lists. Uh, while anger can temporarily lower a person's IQ in the moment, actually being a dumbass is a lifelong problem. Unfortunately for this next Darwin Award winner, his dumbassery problem significantly reduced how long the span of his life would be. In January, 
of 2008, a 23-year-old heavily pierced man in Pennsylvania decided to have some fun at work. He wondered, what would it feel like to connect an electronic control tester to my chest piercings? <laughs> Several coworkers tried to convince him that this was a very, very bad idea. Do not wire yourself up to an electronic device and then turn it on. He's like, nah, I got this. He proceeded to connect two alligator clips to his, to his metal nipple piercings very close to his heart. He hit the test button and then he's out. His coworkers uh, were still trying to revive him with CPR. Uh, when police and rescue personnel arrived, they were not successful. It killed him immediately. Just stopped his heart. W- wish this award said what, what exact kind of dis- device was, like how many volts it put into it, but it doesn't really matter. What matters is that everyone was like, no, don't do this. This is a very bad idea. This is really stupid. This is, and, and he did it anyway. I just feel like if a group of people who don't really care about you that much, like, like coworkers, are telling you it's a real bad idea to do something, they're probably right. Like, it's not your mom who can be overly protective, whatever. It's just, you know, people who don't have that kind of investment in your life. And if they're telling you, don't fucking do this, uh, it probably really is a, a terrible idea. They're probably right. Because if it was just kind of a bad idea, but might be really funny to watch, they would for sure tell you to do it. Right? I feel like that's human nature. Like, like if Joe Paisley, who I like a lot, if Joe Paisley told me he was going to take off all his clothes and run around the block, I would be all for it. I'm like, fuck yeah. So that's awesome. That's a great idea. And I would say that knowing that he might get arrested, but worth it for me to get those laughs. I would say it knowing that he might fall down and skin his dick up. I don't care. It's not my dick. And he'll live. Right? Bad idea for sure. Hard for him to explain that to his wife if he gets caught. But I would still be like, hell yeah, you should do that. It's fucking awesome. I'll record it. But if he was like, hey, I was just thinking I could take off all my clothes and then I could try and jump from the roof of the building and see if I could make it to the roof of my SUV. Then I'd be like, what? Fuck no. Dude, that's fucking stupid. That's how you die. That's really idiotic. Just always remember, there's a lot of people out there who will encourage you to do really harmful things. Very few who encourage you to do things where there's a, where there's a good chance of death though. If a bunch of people around you, a bunch of people that aren't related to you are telling you, oh, no. Super dangerous, probably almost always right. Uh, The next Darwin Award recipient was part of an engineering duo that worked at the Skagit Raceway in Washington State fixing cars. There were no dummies when it came to cars, but during their time working in a custom machine shop in 2010, they dreamed up the idea of making a rocket, kind of. They took a 55-gallon barrel into the parking lot, filled it with four gallons of methanol, sat on top of it, and then lit the bunghole. And 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 that's not an Albert Fish reference. This isn't Albert fire in the butthole fish. No, this is a, the hole in the, in the barrel is sometimes called a bunghole. The, the idea was to shoot across the parking lot like rodeo clowns for a few moments of fun. Instead, they made a bomb <laughs> that blew up with enough force to launch the barrel 120 feet. One of the men died pretty much immediately. The other guy got all burned to shit and learned a valuable lesson. Don't light a bunghole on fire. Guys, come on. You're engineers. You're not juvenile delinquents. I almost set myself on fire a lot of times when I was between 10 and 22 years old. But now the worst I do is pour way too much charcoal lighter on the grill because it's fun to see that flame really go. And sometimes shoot a buddy's flamethrower. Uh, but I stop with my flame, you know, fun at singeing a little bit of arm hair, maybe singeing a tiny bit of eyebrow. How the hell did engineers not know this was a terrible idea? Like, I, I feel like there's, a, there's more to this story, like drugs, like a lot of drugs uh, or a lot of alcohol. If, if you add just one word to the story, either drunk or high, I don't question it. Uh, in my 20s, in front of my ex-wife, I, I once threw some guy's girlfriend over my shoulder and just ran down the street with her. Just ran down the street with a stranger on St. Patrick's Day because I was blackout drunk. And apparently no one cared for it. No one thought it was fun at all. Uh, and I did it because I was fucking hammered and, I'm, and because I'm a dirtbag. Um, so, so think before you drink. Speak, speaking of alcohol, this next award winner proves that it is best to think before you drink. In, in April of 2012, a Canadian man who washed beer trucks for a living was busy doing his work when he found a loose bottle of what appeared to be blue vodka behind the seat of one of the trucks he was cleaning. Sweet. I, sh- I should probably drink that. He seemed to have thought to himself, bypassing his nose and taste buds, he just took a huge swig from the bottle, which was filled with one of the worst kinds of vodkas on the market today. The kind that tastes a lot like wiper fluid. The kind that is not vodka and is wiper fluid. After being rushed to the hospital, he died from methanol poisoning at a nearby hospital. Uh, to make the, more, the story more interesting, his family filed a lawsuit against the parent company of the beer stores. The company was legally chastised and is now forbidden to store windshield wiper fluid and used alcohol bottles, which does annoy me. That's the world we live in. When you can own a company and then be sued because one of your dumb shit employees 
essentially steals some of your shit and hurts himself or dies. Yeah, fucking what are you doing? Just trying to fucking sneak it. And think before you drink, or at least think, what the fuck am I drinking before you drink it? And, and again, this story makes more sense if he was already drunk when he did it. Uh, I'm just amazed by people who seem to make drunk decisions when they're in fact sober. This next Darwin Award winner, way, way too old to be doing what he did. I'm amazed he lived as long as he did if this is how he lived his life. What's amazing to me about the story is that he did make it to 68 years old, not that he died. A man named Gerard was a 68-year-old uh, man with a sweet Porsche Cayenne SUV. And he got it stuck on some train tracks when he was driving it one day. The safety bars came down on each side of the road, kind of trapped the, uh, the Porsche on the rails. According to witnesses, it took Gerard a, a while to realize he was stuck on the tracks. Finally, he, he, uh, he jumps from the car and he starts to run when the train's getting close, but he doesn't run away from the tracks. No, he runs on the tracks or just like right next to the track, like on the edge, straight towards an oncoming train, waving his arms in an attempt to save his SUV. And he was partly successful. Uh, the car received a little bit less damage than its owner who landed 30 meters away. <laughs> Jesus Christ, it's launched about a, almost 100 feet. He kind of blocked the train. And then attempts to revive what was left of Gerard was obviously un unsuccessful. My thought is, didn't you have car insurance? I mean, if you're driving a Porsche Cayenne at 68, you, you probably can afford auto insurance. Like, I fucking love my F-150. I would hate for it to get run over by a train. But if it did get stuck on some tracks, I'm fucking out of there. Because here's the thing. I have insurance, and there's a lot of other F-150s that I also would love. This is literally the exact same truck. It's like, dude, there are plenty of other Porsche Cayennes on the, on the market. Like, I would get it a little more if he was driving, like, the 1964 Aston Martin. Right, the DB5 driven by Sean Connery playing James Bond and Goldfinger. It's, it's one of a kind. It's irreplaceable. But still, maybe good in that, to remember in that situation that running towards a train and yelling at it to suddenly stop has worked exactly zero times in train history. The entire reason that train crossings exist is, is because trains are super bad at quickly stopping. Right? Look up momentum. If you don't, you're like, why would a train have a hard time stopping? They're very fucking heavy. Um, okay, let's go, let's go, uh, to Virginia now. In September of 2016 in Virginia, a 20 year old woman named Sydney G did something so stupid. It really made me laugh the first time I read this, even though I knew she died, which might mean I'm a terrible person, but it's, it, this is, this might be the dumbest one of them all. <laughs> Sydney and an unnamed accomplice found a mattress on the side of the road. They didn't have any bungee cords with them, but they really wanted this mattress. So Sydney decided to use her own body weight to keep the mattress on the roof of, of the car while that, while they just drove away while her friend drove like what, what, how does any part of you think this will work? Like on any level, right? It's a mattress, right? If any air gets underneath, which it's going to, cause some, the air is, you know, bouncing off the, uh, off the windshield and it's going to grab the front of the mattress and it's going to for sure fucking lift it up like every single time and nothing to hold it down. Like what? I mean, with the size of a mattress, the size of a, a person, top of a car, it's not like you can reach over each side of the mattress and kind of cling to like the, where the windows are rolled down, like cling inside the windows. Even if you could do that, it wouldn't work for very long. No one is strong enough to hold that down once the, once the car gets going with any kind of speed whatsoever. So of course, Sydney dies when the mattress, of course, flies off and just fucking lands on the road, which is going to do a thousand out of a thousand times. That will never, ever work. Right? Remember that time you were driving on the freeway and you saw somebody holding a mattress down to the top of their car, just fucking coasting on it with nothing tying it down? You've never seen that because they would never last and make it to that speed. Uh, to make it even worse, Prince William County uh, Police spokesperson Nathan Probus stated that the van was driven by an unlicensed driver. Right, Dumb to do that with any driver. Even dumber to do it with someone who, who shouldn't be driving because they've either never passed a driving test or because they've had their driver's license taken away. Like doing that to me, that's like, that's like thinking you could just sneak onto a fucking plane and go for a free flight. Like, like, like Superman. Like you could just cling to the top of the plane and be like, ha, fucking beat the system. I'll fucking slide off when we land. You know, right? this, this is real life, not a Mission Impossible movie. Uh, according to some highly reliable sources in Michigan on January of 2016, a 58-year-old man named Clifford was driving without pants, without a seatbelt, and watching Pornhub on his phone. Add a wide open sunroof on a cold winter Sunday and you have a recipe for disaster. At 3.40 a.m., Clifford's Toyota went out of control on the on-ramp to I-75, rolled, crashed, ejected Cliff out the sunroof, killed him. 
<laughs> Ken, he may have already passed on his genes, but he definitely gets the Darwin Award for dying in the middle of fucking jerking off. Like, dude, why can't, okay. Why can't you just, <laughs> why can't, if, you're, if you have to jerk off when you're driving, if you have to do it, I'm not gonna lie, I've done it before. It's been many years, but I have done it. You know I'm forthcoming about this kind of stuff with you guys. You, you don't fucking watch, why, you don't have to watch porn. Go into your memory. Access your memory. Eyes on the road. Hand on your dick. Or finger fucking DJ in your clitoris. You can, you can do that. You can have one hand on the steering wheel. Both eyes on the road. Other hand, pleasuring yourself. You don't need to have this whole fucking complicated situation in your car. Here's another really stupid pair of road rage deaths. It happened in February of last year in Poland. Fuck. Of course it did. I was waiting for Poland to show up. Two Polish cars drove into each other on the freeway. And then each of the drivers got out and started arguing on the freeway. And then they started fighting still on the freeway. And then they died because they got hit by other cars. They were driving on the fucking freeway. This one reminds me of joggers. I I, I used to see down in LA, like running out into the street with their headphones on, clearly not paying attention to their surroundings whatsoever. And I would just think like, you know that you're also not in a car, right? Like, you know that if I fucking hit you one time, which I kind of want to do right now, you, you're going to lose because you're going to die. Right? Uh, th- right now where I live, right now in Idaho, there's a blind corner on the road to my house, right in my neighborhood. No sidewalk on either side of the road. So people end up walking in the street, which you kind of have to do, but they do it and they don't pay attention at all. Like I've driven home and had to swerve around people casually just walking their dog or jogging out in the street, like way out in the road with their back to oncoming traffic. And I just always think, man, like you have a lot more faith in society than I do. I would for sure not trust me if I were you to not run your ass over. Uh, there are tons of stories in Darwin Award, of Darwin Award winners dying when they're peeing. Uh, come to find out most of them are urban legends. It can't be verified in any way. But one such incident was verified in Seattle, reported in 1999, when a man pissing on a freeway overpass lost his footing and fell 45 feet to his death. Dude, you got to brace yourself. Another one that only makes sense to me if they're drunk or high. Otherwise, again, going back to the hands. You use one hand to brace, the other hand to pull your pants out. I've never needed two hands to go number one in my life ever. Like, what? No part of me under, like, fucking grab something. So those, so those are the basic Darwin Award winners. Uh, but we do have categories. I know some of those people could have fit in some categories, but they were a little bit more miscellaneous. Now we're going to go into different little sections. We're going to start with animal-related, totally avoidable deaths. Seems like uh, at least 10% of all Darwin Awards involve a needless animal interaction. Here are a handful of the ones I found the most interesting. 1999. 15 snakes were... (laughs) I don't know why snake deaths do always fucking crack me up. 15 deaths were found in the vicinity of a decomposed body in Stanton, Delaware. A neighbor complained about a terrible smell, which led to the discovery of the body, a three-day-old corpse, and eight rattlesnakes and two cobras. <laughs> 45, just, I feel no sympathy for this person. Like none, absolutely none. The 45-year-old owner of the reptiles was found 10 feet from an open cage of a young diamondback rattler. Apparently the guy was feeding the snake and then got terminally bitten. <sighs> Residents of the apartments were evacuated by the Delaware Animal Rescue Team while the search was conducted for the missing serpents. Neighbors said they had no idea that this weird loner was keeping poisonous snakes. Why does anyone get a poisonous snake for a pet? It's so fucking dumb. And if you're like, hey man, I have a fucking poisonous snake. That seems pretty judgy. Yes, I think your choice in a poisonous snake is super fucking dumb. Why would you have a bunch of them? A similar story inspired one of the first stand-up jokes I ever wrote almost two decades ago now. I still believe it exactly today. It's a little joke, so I'm going to tell it here. I, I, I normally keep stand-up you know, removed from uh, Time Suck, but this fits so perfectly. Uh, the joke would go, I would say, uh, hey, you know how sometimes when somebody dies, it's sad? But other times, it makes sense. I read about a guy who got a poisonous cobra for a pet, and it bit him, and I died. And I thought, yeah, it was a poisonous cobra. What was plan A? Like, like what was he doing at home with this thing? Just, you the cutest little cobra? Yes, you are. Ah! No, bad cobra, dead good. That's the only time I've done one of my stand-up jokes here on the podcast. Probably, probably uh, going to be the only time remain, but it just fits so perfectly with that. I still think like, yeah, when you get a poisonous cobra for a snake and it bites you and it dies, it's like, that, yeah, that was, that was, that's how shit is supposed to work out. 
In Australia in 1989, a rather impressionable uh, martial arts student listened with attention when his Kung Fu instructor dramatically informed the class, now that you have reached this level in your training, you could kill wild animals with your bare hands. (laughs) This trainee took this statement as gospel truth and headed over to the Melbourne Zoo in Australia uh, to, to test his metal with the wildest animal of them all, the lion. Went straight for the lion in the dead of night, slipped into the zoo, leapt into the lion enclosure, engaged a suitable king of the jungle in hand-to-fucking-claw combat. Uh, <laughs> and he lost. He lost savagely. Uh, zoo employees found his remains the next day, two arms and hands, and just fucking shreds of red fur grasped tightly in the, uh, in the fingers of the deceased. <laughs> what the fuck? That has to be the dumbest one yet. Like, even if you could kill a wild animal with your bare hands, why would you start with a lion? Dude, you gotta work your way up. Start with like a mouse or a squirrel. Work your way up to a raccoon. Go hand to hand with a raccoon. Maybe then take on a deer, one without antlers. Maybe then you jump up to elk. You leave lion for, I think, dead last. Right, you go for lion right after you can take on like two bears at the same time, or uh, even better, maybe outside of hunting, what you can eat, maybe just don't fucking go around needlessly killing animals, you fucking maniac. Uh, okay, let's talk about tigers now. In May of 1999, two German tourists, a man and a woman, were enjoying the last day of vacation at Safari Park, a wild game park in Spain. Safari Park is a controlled reserve hosting a variety of wild animals living in natural habitats. Visitors driving to the park are cautioned many times. Do not open their windows. Remain in your vehicle at all times. Frequent warning signs posted in a variety of languages, including German. While driving through a tiger grotto, the man Wilhelm and his companion parked the car, emerged from it for reasons unclear, locked the doors behind them. (laughs) I don't want someone stealing their car when they're in the middle of a place that no one should fucking be outside of their car. And then they were set upon almost immediately (laughs) by three Bengal tigers lurking in the brush nearby. Ah, the big cats, two males and a female, 10 to 12 years old, pounced on them, breaking their necks and quickly silencing their screams. Security guards rushed to the scene, uh, arriving to find the woman beheaded and the man disemboweled. And I don't, and I don't feel bad for him, right? I will, I will though say, this is a way I could see myself dying. And if I do die this way, don't feel sad for me, right? I can see myself just being like, no, 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 we're good. Come on, let's get some good pictures. Come on, just for a second. We're just going to walk out into the tiger infested woods. And get some pictures of those wildebeests over there. What, what could go wrong? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. Big, big cats do scare the shit out of me. I did go on a lion safari once in South Africa, and I had zero interest. I was so nervous the whole time. I was worried about being a Darwin Award winner just for even going on it, the safari. I was thinking like, yeah, if one of these lions somehow figures out how to get in this fucking Hummer and kills us, we deserve it. I, I believe I asked, uh, you're sure they can't get in here to the guide more than once? Uh, I don't like getting scratched by fucking house cats. Right? Their little claws are so sharp and it stings for a while after they scratch you. Listen to dangerous animal warnings, meat sacks. They're written for a reason. Okay, again, another one that feels uh, too stupid to be true, but I, but I do think it probably was tr- is true. Uh, th- this apparently happened in upstate New York in 2008. A 50-year-old man was bird hunting with his buddies and his dog. They stopped for a smoke and his dog found the leg bone of a deer. The man tried to take the bone away, but the dog refused to give it up. He just stayed out just out of reach. Frustrated, the man grabbed his loaded shotgun by the muzzle. <laughs> Began swinging it like a club. Like, what? Why are you hitting fucking your dog with the butt of your gun? Each time he swung it, the dog would move out of the way. Suddenly, the club struck the ground and fired, shooting the man in the abdomen. He shot himself in the stomach. He was airlifted to a nearby hospital where he died from his injuries, and the dog was okay. <laughs> uh, I, would, I would have liked this story so much more if it was just the dog and that guy. And they heard this story, and I was just left to wonder, like, well, how do they know exactly what happened? Right? Maybe, maybe he actually shot himself when he's out with just his dog. Or maybe the dog got tired of him trying to take that fucking deer bone. Right? Maybe, maybe the dog just fucking took a, took a crack at shooting Captain Fur, Fun Ruiner. You know, it's like the old saying, you know, never get uh, in between a dog and his bone. Or he might get bit or shotgunned. Uh, according to two different Darwin Award sources, a Brazilian farmer, uh, tired of a beehive in his orange tree, decided he would remove the big ass hive himself. When I first read this, my immediate thought was, oh shit, this, this sounds exactly how I could die. I would for sure try to do this. Like I would see getting, a ri- getting rid of a giant beehive is an exciting challenge. Well, this guy had no clue on, on how to remove a beehive, but he was happy to try. And again, for sure sounds like something I would do. And then he thought fire would be his best method. I'm still in. 
Still on the same page with this guy. Uh, I once, when I was uh, around 20, I poured gasoline on a ground hornet's nest after one of them stung me and I got really fucking angry. I was working on a construction site with my dad and I, I, I poured a bunch of gas into their little ground hornet's nest, set it on fire, and I actually got to watch one of those little fuckers try to fly out while it was burning. Uh, to protect his face from bee stings and smoke, this guy tied a plastic bag around his face and then set the beehive on fire. And this is where I'm no longer with him. Like, like what? You, you did what? You tied a plastic bag around your head and, and secured it based on what we're, we know happened to him next. Not a good idea. Not, not, a, not a good thing to do even for some, uh, you know, auto, auto erotic asphyxiation. Find a different way to get your jollies. And then, of course, the guy suffocated to death as one done, as one does, excuse me, when they, when they tie a plastic bag around their fucking head. <sighs> Let's head down under for our next animal fatality. In November of 1995, the badly decomposed remains of a man named Neil from Melbourne are discovered in a field near the Tulando Reservoir. Not sure if that's how you pronounce that, by the way. Uh, Shockingly, there's no Australian Reservoir pronunciation guide on the internet. Uh, Neil's death is shrouded mystery, tragedy, and a ridiculous homemade merman fish type suit. Local law enforcement officials said the 49-year-old man was wearing a heavy green plastic bodysuit constructed from old waterbed material. The suit featured a full-length zipper along the spine, and it constricted Neil's legs into a mermaid-esque tail. The only openings aside from the zipper were two eye holes. What? Fuck, what? Neil's stupid suit enclosed his entire body and restricted his breathing as well as his movement, and he, and he died in this suit. Uh, making things even weirder, the, the investigators found a second identical uh, suit other than just being a different color in his garage. There was a yellow suit made the same way. Like, what was this guy doing? Like, apparently he liked to, to, to wear a weird merman homemade fish suit of sorts. And he had another suit for, I guess, because sometimes he liked to dress up in a fish suit with what? With somebody else? There'd be two of them. Like, like what I started wondering is like, like who, who zipped him up? You can't, you, could, you can't zip yourself up in that son of a bitch. I wouldn't think. Did they, just, did they just bail whoever zipped him up when he started to suffocate? Or when they found out he was dead? Did they push him over and kill him? Like, like why would you ever make this in the first place? Is this some, some very specific sexual fetish? Like, if someone else wore the other suit, wouldn't they need a third person to zip them both in? Why, why would you make eye holes, but not a mouth hole? How, how do you go to the bathroom in one of those suits? Right? Do, do, you just, do you just shit into your mer tail? That's exactly how they do it in Hollywood. Making that merman show me his peanut butter butt butter money. Um, <laughs> I fucking don't even know what I'm talking about anymore. So I busted Keaton. Used to cream a merman suit once a week on a set of parlor bedroom and bath. Showbiz. Uh, enough critters. Let's move on to a group of Darwin Award winners Albert Fish would be very interested in. Uh, deaths that involve private parts. Let, let's head to New Zealand. Uh, a 25-year-old man, uh, some crazy Kiwi bastard named Travis Lane, was very drunk and high after spending the night at a house party in the Otago Township of New Zealand, or Otago. Uh, a group of friends were standing around a campfire outside, and Lane thought it would be funny to pull his pants down and moon or use his brown eye to stare down oncoming traffic. Every time he saw a car coming by, he'd run towards the road, drop his pants, spread his butt cheeks, then walk back to the group and have a good laugh around the bonfire. Well, one of these times, eventually, Lane thrust his bare bottom a little too far into oncoming traffic, and a car k- hit him directly on his ass, and it launched him, <laughs> and it launched him bleeding out into the distance. He suffered a broken arm, brain injury, died in the hospital. And the coroner showed no sympathy for Lane, saying he paid the ultimate price for his foolishness. I do feel a little bad for this guy. He was drunk and high and having stupid fun with his friends. I, I think the lesson here is, if, if you... You know, want to stare down some traffic with your brown eye and you get away with it after you first do it, then, you know, you got to quit while you're behind. Dad joke! Because, <laughs> you know, behind is like a fucking, it's not a word for a butt. And uh, I'm going to, I'm going to show myself out. <laughs> I hope, I hope Joe's ridiculous laugh, his sarcastic laugh just showed up in the, uh, in the audio. I heard it. Uh, this next uh, award winner actually didn't die, but he did blow his dick off. So it's worth mentioning. Oh, this poor son of a bitch. 17-year-old from Pennsylvania told the police he sustained serious injuries with an explosive device hidden in his backpack by unknown persons when it detonated. This is not the truth. What actually happened is he found an M80 explosive at a relative's house and decided he'd take it home. And then for whatever reason, he decided to repeatedly light and extinguish the fuse on this powerful explosive. I guess just a, he's again, like some kind of Mission Impossible movie or something. And, and, and this is the exact type of thing a, a 17-year-old boy does. 
After many times successfully lighting the fuse and then putting it out before it explodes, he decides to give it one more tragic go. And this time he can't put it out. So he does something really, really dumb. Instead of throwing it as far as he could and quickly, he plants the M80 between his thighs, covers it with his hand, and I guess hopes to snuff it out that way. Instead, blows off his hand, his right leg, and blows off his monkey and his peewees. Took, took himself out of adding to the gene pool with one terrible decision. I would feel more comfortable making fun of this dude if he was like 47 instead of 17. What a terrible burden to have to go through the rest of your life, down a hand, down a leg, minus all your junk, and that's the reason why. We should make it harder to get sympathy from people. I hope he lies. I hope he lies about how he lost his dick and balls. Hope he tells people he tried to save a baby from like a rabid wolf or something. Um, and speaking of dick and balls, this is, this is, I think the most ridiculous thing. Cause I didn't know this was a thing until I, until I came across this, this is another Darwin non-fatality, uh, someone who didn't take themselves off the planet, but did, you know, make it impossible for them to reproduce. If you want to inject some cocaine into your body, you're already making terrible life decisions, but if you must, maybe don't squirt it into your pee hole. Physicians from New York Hospital Cornell Medical Center reported the the case of a 34-year-old man who suffered severe bleeding under the skin after pumping cocaine directly into his pee hole. Seriously. This led to complications that destroyed his penis, nine fingers, and parts of his legs. This is so weird. Here's a quote from uh, Dr. Samuel Perry, the professor of clinical uh, psychiatry there. They fill an eyedropper or a syringe with a cocaine solution and inject it into the penis. The man had injected cocaine before intercourse in an effort to enhance sexual performance. Why do people do shit like this in the bedroom? Why can't sex be just enough? Why can't just sex be as far as you need to go? Like, it feels really, really good. I don't know if you've tried it. Like, if an attractive physical body isn't enough for you, maybe instead of shooting coke into your dick, maybe see a therapist at least one time. I mean, at least try it. I feel like that's reasonable. Well, Captain Coke Dick was admitted to the hospital because his penis ended up remaining erect for three days after he did this, <laughs> resulting in, in the painful inability to urinate. Uh, on his third day uh, in the hospital, the man's erection suddenly subsided, and then over the next 12 hours, blood leaked into the tissue of his feet, hands, genitals, back, and chest. Blood coagulation caused tissue to die over large areas of this patient's body. He was transferred to the burn unit of New York Hospital Cornell Medical Center. Doctors there were forced to amputate the man's legs above the knee, and all but one of his fingers to stop the spread of gangrene. And according to this insane story that we can't verify, uh, this guy's dick just fell off by itself. Like his dick rotted off. The man is currently recovering in a rehabilitation, a rehabilitation facility, as much as you can recover from having your dick rot and fall off. Men who inject cocaine into, into the penis report that it gives them a sexual high. Drug abuse treatment experts have previously reported external use of cocaine as a sexual stimulant. Cocaine powder is rubbed onto the surface of the genital organs by both men and women in the effort to halt premature ejaculation or improve sexual sensations. A doctor stated, we report this case to alert clinicians to this new method of cocaine abuse and to describe its rare and previously unreported complications. Meat sacks, please. If you take one thing and one thing only away from the suck, let it be that you're not supposed to shoot coke into your dick or rub it onto any part of your genital business. If, if you need Coke, just snort it like a red-blooded goddamn American. Do drugs like a grown-up. All right, now let's head to the Midwest for some more dick tragedy. It is reported that this event occurred in Indiana in the early 80s. Late one March evening, a man named Bruce awoke at the foot of a utility pole in the woods, his dog asleep by his side, and a crispy dead raccoon nearby. Bruce was then alarmed to discover severe burns on his forearms, hands, and genitals, which would eventually become amputated. (laughs) What happened? Well, the details came out in court when Bruce sued the utility company for removing him from the gene pool. He'd been out uh, raccoon hunting. When his dog caught the scent, chased a raccoon up a power pole. The raccoon perched on a glass insulator. He strapped his trusty steel pole climbers to his boots, made his way up the pole, then fried his dick and hands off. The court found Bruce contributory negligent. Um, stating, it is clear that in climbing the utility pole, slapping and squalling at the raccoon, I love that they wrote slapping and squalling at the raccoon, thereby agitating it when it was perilously close to charged wires, Bruce Bruce should have appreciated the hazard that ultimately befell him. So very nice court lingo for like, what the fuck, dude? This is all your fault. 
Yeah, Bruce, not the power company's fault that you are really dumb. It's a fucking power pole, not some kind of raccoon fruit tree, right? Hopefully Bruce is out there somewhere giving like one of the most disgusting don't do what I did speeches at like high school graduations around the nation. You see this, kids? Look at, look at where a man's dick and balls are supposed to be. Look at the charred flesh. This is what happens when you try and slap a coon off a power pole. The good Lord smites away your dick. Uh, the next mini category of awards is dick related. Let's talk about three sex related Darwin Award winners. Be gone, Lucifina. A double Darwin Award occurred during the act of lovemaking on March 21st, 1999 in Bucharest. Romanian soccer midfielder Mario Bugino, 24, and Mirella Lansu, 23, could not wait to make love on a Sunday. As soon as their car was parked in the garage, they started going at it. They died from carbon monoxide poisoning shortly thereafter because leaving a car running in an enclosed, non-ventilated space is a very common suicide method. How have they never heard that? You don't leave your car running in an enclosed garage or other enclosed space ever. Where do you think all the fucking exhaust fume is heading? Also in 1999, this time in May and in Mexico, a young Mexican couple were found dead in the back of a hearse. Same reason. Jose, 23, employed by the Perez Diaz Funeral Home, met Ana Maria on Saturday for a romantic tryst in his hearse. He parked in a warehouse, left the engine running to provide air conditioning. In the enclosed location, the carbon monoxide-laden exhaust fumes seeped into the vehicle, fatally poisoning the couple as they're eventually going to do. Again, right? Don't fuck in a running car in an unventilated space. Carbon monoxide poison is very real. I had a neighbor die of it two years ago when she had a gas leak in her home. Not kidding. At least this couple died in a hearse to make the funeral a little easier for the family. Right? I guess you could probably leave them in there, take them straight to the cemetery. I'm sure that didn't happen. Uh, this last sex related Darwin award, more of a solo act than a duo. Uh, <laughs> some of the story comes from an alleged eyewitness. It, ha- it happened in England, May of 2014. Uh, being part of emergency services, firemen are called upon to get people out of unlikely situations. We were summoned to the accident and emergency department of a central London hospital to assist in the removing of a quote thing ring, uh, when our, with our ring cutters at the ready. We were presented with the patient, his meat and testicles extremely swollen on, and, and such a dark purple, they were almost blackened. The whole sorry mess was encircled by a thick titanium ring. Normally, the procedure to remove a thing ring is a five-minute affair, like thing ring, but our cutters could not make a mark on the titanium. After expending a number of cutter blades, we had to concede defeat. The man in question had put himself into the situation three days prior to committing himself to accident and emergency care delaying the hospital visit due to embarrassment and in a vain hope that it would resolve itself in time. Unfortunately, (laughs) this error in judgment cost him dearly. The doctors can often drain blood and remove the ring uh, the way it went on. I love this is the thing they have to deal with on a regular basis. Yet by the time he sought help and our tools had been defeated, his jewels were past saving. And that's one of the, uh, yeah, one of the people who had to respond to this, you know, a, a quote from them. Man, dude castrated himself. Lesson here is, don't put a ring on your cock and balls that you can't cut off. There are silicon, silicone, whatever, uh, cock rings out there. At least that's what a friend told me. And by friend, I mean, that's what I've put on my dick before. You, you can put a silicone cock ring on and it, and it fucking bends enough. It, it's firm enough to be tight. If that's what you like, but also can bend. And then worst case scenario, emergency services can for sure cut it off. What? Don't fucking titanium. What? Like some of this shit, like why, why would anyone make that? Okay, let's move it along. This next section is about partying way too hard, partying yourself to death. It can sometimes not work out well when you mix dumb and alcohol or dumb and drugs. <laughs> this first one made me laugh maybe the hardest uh, uh, of the ones we've come across. In Texas in 2004, a man named Michael decided to drink his liquor with his bottom mouth instead of his face mouth, which is not how you're supposed to drink. His wife said he was addicted to <laughs> he was addicted to enemas and often ingested alcohol in this manner. I for whatever reason I've never heard of this before this. Like doing an alcohol enema to get drunk. One night, this machine shop owner decided to beer bong some sherry straight into his butthole. Like he he reverse pooped two one and a half liter bottles of sherry. That's more than a hundred fluid ounces straight into his butthole. And then promptly died of alcohol poisoning, which of course is going to happen. According to toxicology reports, the 58-year-old's blood alcohol level was 0.47%. That's nearly six times 
Many states legal limit of 0.08%. How did he think this was going to work out? No sane person would chug as fast as you could get it down. Like I'm just like it's like like you're in a fucking drinking contest. Two full bottles of wine in a matter of sec fortified wine. Why would you think that you could handle that through your ass? When I was in college, I used to beer bong. I would bong one or two beers at a time. Never more than that because I knew a kid whose friend died when he beer bonged a fifth of vodka. Drank an entire fifth of vodka in about 15 fucking seconds and then died immediately because it stopped his heart. You gotta know your limits. And two back-to-back bottles of sherry shot straight into your fucking butthole is far beyond anyone's limit. The next two awards have, an, have a Halloween theme. The first one is unconfirmed, but it feels possible to me. A college student supposedly costumed himself as Dracula for Halloween. As a finishing touch, he put a, a pine board down the front of his shirt so he could realistically sink a knife into the board and pretend he was transfixed by a vampire killing steak. Apparently, he didn't consider the strength of the, of the thin pine board when he tapped the knife in with a hammer. Propelled by the force of the hammer, the sharp blade split the soft wood, ended up burying itself in his heart. He staggered from his dorm room into the Halloween party and died. This one may be an urban legend, but I mean, I could also see somebody doing this. And if, you, and, if, and if they did, it's like, dude, get a fake knife. Or at least you put the board on the floor, then hammer in the knife. <laughs> and, and special, whether it happened or not, note to college age suckers, because I remember, you know, this point in life, you feel immortal. Just remember that nature doesn't give a fuck how much potential you have or how much life you have left to live. Do something stupid and you die just like everybody else. Here's another Halloween Darwin Award. Um, <laughs> okay. This one is, uh, this one is, do with a mummy suit here. Tragic mummy accident. For Halloween in 1998, a Canadian man dressed as a mummy by wrapping himself for he- from head to toe in fluffy cotton batting. The, coffin was, the cotton was taped at the wrists and ankles. White gloves, running shoes, completed this ensemble. As the mummy waited for his girlfriend to dress for pictures, they're going to go to a Halloween party. They never made it because he carelessly lit a cigarette and then burst into flames. Firefighters arrived within minutes, but the mummy costume was already reduced to ashes, right down to the white coveralls underneath. The man kept repeating, it's my fault when they showed up. And then the poor bastard was taken to Soldiers Memorial Hospital with second and third degree burns and died the next morning. I feel like this is a good reminder to, uh, to uh, listeners who smoke. Smoking kills, sometimes very quickly, right? It's not, it's not just uh, a way to ingest a drug. It's also, you know, you're holding fire. And holding fire next to flammable things, sometimes bad. Sometimes fire, bad. Fire, bad. Uh, The last party-related award goes to a group of weirdos in 1969. On August 15th, 1969, Hurricane Camille claimed 143 victims along the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Most were guilty only of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, Unlike 20 who perished while attending a beachfront hurricane party. They threw a hurricane party. This group ignored uh, several evacuation warnings delivered by emergency teams, continued to party, throw some kind of hippie peace and free love party, you know, going to throw that, you know, like, yeah, we don't, we can just fucking, we, this storm's not going to touch us. We're just smoking some weed, listening to the doors. We're just going to light up some Mary Jane and, you know, just fucking chill, man. It'll be cool. Uh, well, their, their misplaced confidence proved to be tragically misplaced when a 24 foot wave slammed into the apartment building they were in. It destroyed the building, subjected the party goers to gale force winds, violent ocean surges, and nearly all of them died. The lesson here is, of course, don't listen to the doors. There's a lot, there's a lot better bands from the late 60s. Uh, now let's move on to crime. Sometimes crime pays. Other times it kills. And we're going to focus on that kind. Uh, we're going to start in the Philippines. I feel like these are a little easier to laugh at because they are trying to do something criminal. Uh, the first criminal won his Darwin Award on May 25th, 2000, when he tried to pull a DB Pooper Cooper. A man named Augusto boarded a Philippine air flight to Manila, donned a ski mask and swim goggles, pulled out a gun and a grenade, announced he was hijacking the plane. He demanded the plane return to Davao, uh, Davao City, but the pilots convinced him that the aircraft was low on fuel. They continued on toward Manila. Manila. Augusto, undaunted, robbed the passengers of about $25,000, ordered the pilots to lower the plane to 6,500 feet. Then he strapped on a homemade parachute and forced the flight attendants to open the doors and depressurize the plane. And then he, uh, you know, I'm sure was intending to jump, but the wind was so strong that he had trouble getting out of the plane. Finally, one of the flight attendants helpfully pushed him out the door just as that son of a bitch tried to uh, uh, throw the fucking grenade back behind him and blow up the plane, pulled out the pin. And then a best case scenario situation followed. The grenade did not go off anywhere near the plane. And of course, his homemade parachute 
did not open, which I knew was going to happen when I first read Homemade Parachute. A homemade parachute is the best kind of parachute to not open. He fell to the earth and died. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just a fucking very dumb plan. If you're going to try to jump out of a plane, maybe buy a parachute from a place that's good at making parachutes. And now we head to Russia. What is big deal? Death in Russia is like soda pop in America. No one care who drink it. Or something, listen, something like that. A chikatilo better at wrestling than analogy. Uh, late one Russian night in 2007, a comrade named Edward uh, entered uh, the apartment of a 30-year-old handicapped man who slept peacefully as Edward proceeded to rob him. Edward was prepared to leave when suddenly the man woke up. And, the, and then the guy said, I, I couldn't believe my eyes. The dark shape of some goon was standing next to nightstand. This is the, the burglary vic- victim recalling this. I cry out and he attacked me. I was defenseless. Uh, he, he was de- with fist. I had no choice. I hit him between legs with my crutch and he leaped out the window. Thank God I live on first floor. He did not die from fall. I didn't understand at first what had fallen out of his pants. <laughs> when I looked closer, I realized that it was testicle, a man's testicle. I put it in cold water and rushed to phone. And then the handicapped man dialed emergency services several times, but the doctors kept hanging up on him <laughs> when he would tell them that he had ripped a burglar's balls off. Half an hour later, the blood-covered thief was found by a passerby who called the police. The unconscious man was lying on the sidewalk, said the police investigator. When the medics revived him, Allegedly, he started screaming hysterically, give me back my balls. Uh, Edward's genitals were so traumatized, the doctors had to amputee the entire scrotum. So both balls are lost uh, to prevent gangrene. Uh, he lived, but he will not create any more burglars. And, and, and wow, what, what a nice hit of, with that crutch, by the way. Man, that was, that was a hell of a shot. Now let's move on away from genitals and move to painting your face, which you're not supposed to do with certain kinds of paint. In South Carolina in 2009, Two disguised men entered a Sprint store on Sparkleberry Lane, pulled out guns, stole wallets, purses, and credit cards from employees before ordering them into a bathroom. Both men fled, seemingly got away. However, 23-year-old James T. had disguised himself by painting his face gold. Yes, he had covered his skin with gold spray paint, no less. Now, these paints are clearly labeled. It says, do not get on skin, do not get in eyes, do not inhale. Paint fumes of, of this sort are known to be very toxic, and the metallic colors uh, partially noxious. James began having trouble breathing, died wheezing shortly after the robbery took place. To add insult to injury, the disguise was ineffective. Witnesses were certain as to the identity of the other assailant. Had he lived, James, like his surviving accomplice, would have been charged with armed robbery after being easily caught due to being very identifiable due to having paint all over his fucking face. How do you decide to paint your face (laughs) instead of just wearing a mask, right? Just pull, putting nylons over your face. Get a fucking t-shirt, wrap it up, cut some holes in it, do something. How are you like, ah, we don't, we don't have time for that. Just hear, hey, hey, grab that bottle of spray paint. Just spray my face real fast. Um, a lot of the dumb criminal Darwin Award stories have something to do with uh, a criminal electrocuting himself. One guy thought he was stealing a bunch of copper when he put his bolt cutter through an aluminum cable carrying 11,000 volts was immediately fried. Another Darwinian tale involves an inmate, a metal toilet, and biting down on a live wire trying to fix his TV. And the next crime story might be the purest Darwin Awards uh, so far, one of them. In 1990, in the state of Washington, the following mind-boggling attempt at a crime spree occurred. A guy entered a gun shop in the middle of the day to rob it. The shop was full of customers, including a uniformed police officer. Apparently, this criminal had to step around the officer's car to get inside the shop. Upon entering, the would-be robber announced his intentions to hold up the store, fired a couple of warning shots, and then the cop shot and killed him. So, you know, maybe if you're going to rob some place and you see a cop in the place, if you see like a cop car in the parking lot, maybe wait a few minutes for them to leave. Just a thought. Now we head to Siberia. One of the top spots on my list of places I'm least interested in visiting. In December 2008, 23-year-old Strahanja Rosetta was wanted by Croatian police for murder and for robbery of a central post office. Aided by his friend who lent Rosetta 1,500 euros, he fled to Serbia to evade the law. Finding himself unable to earn or steal the funds needed to reimburse his friend, Rosetta attempted to end the matter in another way by murdering his friend. He crawled under his lender's jeep to plant an explosive. However... The muffler was still hot and the heat set off the explosive while he was beneath the vehicle. He died in a hospital in the Serbian capital city of Belgrade. 
only sad part of that story to me is that his friend never got his money back. And, and I imagine had a hard time getting his, you know, Siberian auto insurance to, to cover getting his car blown the fuck up. And now we travel to the Siberia of America, Ohio. Uh, kidding. Ohio just happened to be the next uh, story. I, I, I'm pretty sure Alaska, anywhere north of Fairbanks, is the Siberia of America. On the evening of July 4th, 1991, three fucking idiots, three Eaton men, James, Billy, and Ashley, were killed after their blue Ford pickup rolled over on a country road. Hogs and alcohol were contributing factors to this accident. Uh, Sheriff Andrew Watson said, we found several beer cans in and around the scene. The driver had a blood alcohol content twice the legal limit. The events unfolded like this. This is the most, this is so ridiculous to me. The three men spent a national holiday drinking. Later that evening, they were struck with the sudden craving for some pork chops. I guess they wanted them real fresh. Because instead of trying to find some 24-hour grocery store, um, they <laughs> at 11 p.m., they drove 10 miles to a pig farm intent on stealing one of the hogs. One of the men scaled the fence, tied in the well, one end of a rope to a big ass pig. The other two men started pulling on the 400 pound beast. The stress of st the struggling hog was too much for the six foot chain link fence. A 14 foot section collapsed loudly, startling the other hogs into a stampede. I was asleep when I heard this God awful noise, explained John Wilson, owner of the farm. I run out of the house with my shotgun and shot off both barrels in the air and yelled at them to get on out. Well, the friends, they still had a hold of the one hog loaded up the stolen pig in a flash, tied the rope to the truck, sped down a country road in excess of 90 miles an hour, and they forgot to buckle their seatbelts. Three miles down the road, the hog began making a commotion in the back of the pickup truck. Of course it did. It caused the vehicle to swerve wildly, and then, and then the swerving threw the hog out of the back of the truck. Now it's being dragged along the side of the dirt road. You know, once it starts to being uh, it's dragged, obviously that affects the trajectory of the vehicle and distracts the driver. The driver hits a soft shoulder. The truck rolls 40 feet, ejects all three men from the vehicle, kills all three men. And very hard to feel bad for these guys. I feel bad for the hog. They almost fucking dragged it to death. Apparently, the hog did somehow survive the accident and, and was rewarded uh, a year later by being butchered. <laughs> Not exactly a happy ending. Although, I do imagine it was put down in a much more humane way than being dragged down the road by drunk hillbillies. Uh, some criminals like to leave calling cards behind because they're huge douchebags. In, in March of 1998, Randy Nestor, 28, was a car thief who would often set cars on fire. Uh, setting the car on fire, he reasoned to help the owners collect insurance on their vehicles. This criminal habit became his downfall. After a 10-year career of theft, Randy burned to death in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in a van which he had set on fire from the inside. He forgot that the door handle on the driver's side was broken. Friends tried to release him, but the door was locked. Apparently, this guy forgot the golden rule of setting cars on fire, which is how the doors be open before you set them on fire. Make sure the doors open. Ideally, don't be inside the car. Set the car on fire from the outside. The worst, worst way you can set it on fire is to go inside, shut all the doors, get the fire going, then try to get out. Uh, 1999. This is one of the funnier ones to me. In 1999, a Mexican jail guard died while supervising an inmate's conjugal visit. By supervising, I mean watching and pleasuring himself. Raul Diaz was closely watching an inmate bang his lady from the roof of the prison when he tripped over an air vent, crashed through the skylight, fell 23 feet to land beside the bed when, when the inmate and his wife were enjoying an intimate moment. <laughs> Local law enforcement reported the guard was clutching a pornographic magazine in one hand, which was retained as evidence in binoculars. Look, look, here's a lesson here. You're not supposed to jerk off anyway, any place where you can easily fall to your death. That, that is, I think about that. When I'm about to jerk off, I think, hey, could I fall to my death? No? Okay. Then I'm going to jerk it. No, I think like, am I, am I safe in my bed right now? Okay, I am. Good. Am I in a hotel bed? That's safe. Am I standing in front of Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley's desk right before he comes in for work for the day? Yep. It's a good place to do it. Now let's look at some educated Darwin Award winners. Not everyone who wins a Darwin Award is a dumbass. Uh, a lot of them aren't. But, and some especially are, are very educated. Here, here's a handful of smarty pants that found a stupid way to leave their bodies. Gary Hoy was a respected Toronto lawyer and philanthropist. Sadly, he is now mostly remembered for his embarrassing death. While attending a reception for new students, he decided to demonstrate the strength of the boardroom's unbreakable, quote unquote, windows by throwing himself against them. Unfortunately, they proved less indestructible than advertised, and the lawyer plunged 24 stories into the courtyard below. According to witnesses, Hoy would often do this stunt to impress visitors but would normally just bounce harmlessly off the glass. 
Indeed, tempting fate, he'd already performed the trick once during the reception before making his ill-fated second attempt. Hoy falls into the category of people who should have known better. He was a well-educated postgraduate and former professional engineer. As such, he should have realized that the unbreakable claim was not literally true. And maybe he should have had, you know, an unbreakable pane of glass installed that just separates one office from the lobby or something. Something where the worst case scenario is looking like a jackass, not dying like a jackass. That is one I, I, I relate to not at all. Never would do that. Way too afraid of falling to my death. I, I probably wouldn't die the following way either because I'm also not interested in risking getting my head crushed. Very anti getting my head crushed. This next award winner proves that not all scientists are created equal. Astronomers need to have a good understanding of the universe. Sadly, some of these highly qualified individuals are still absent minded enough to forget really basic facts. Award winning astronomer. Mark Aronson, PhD, was working late at night on April 30th, 1987 at the Kitt Peak National Observatory in Tucson, Arizona, where he'd won an award he'd probably sooner not have claimed. In order to ensure that the sky was clear enough of clouds for accurate viewing, the astronomer periodically stuck his head out of a hatch at the top of the dome. Bear in mind that the one golden rule of the observatory was that you shouldn't check outside the dome when the telescope is in motion. However, in his eagerness to get a good view, he disregarded this directive the designers at the Kitt Peak Observatory had tried to idiot-proof the telescope by making sure it shut down when someone opened the hatch. Unfortunately, big piece of equipment, and it doesn't stop immediately. The heavy dome's momentum meant that it kept turning for just a second or two after being switched off, and then Dr. Aronson's head was idiotically crushed in these moments. Okay, now it is time for a booby trap backfire. Just because you can build a booby trap doesn't mean it's not going to kill its creator. Louis Dethy was a senior citizen with a, with a grudge. His wife divorced him. He believed his kids and grandchildren had abandoned him. And his mother bequeathed the house that he had built to one of his daughters. Dethy was a highly qualified retired engineer with a pension for booby traps. <laughs> Such a weird thing to have a pension for. What's your pension for? Uh, booby traps. I like to make booby traps. Really? Huh, I've, I mean, I met people with a pension for like smoking interesting you know, pipes or, or a pension for, for listening to unusual music, but never booby traps. In a world of diabolical creativity, 79-year-old Dethy transformed his home into a death trap. He used nylon fishing wire to rig up 19 different concealed shotguns. This guy was clearly out of his fucking mind. He rigged up 19 concealed shotguns to common household items such as stacks of plates, chests, crates of beer. Unbelievably, the bitter old man intended to kill or maim his family when they came in to claim the house he believed was rightfully his. However, poor memory may have been his undoing. The Belgian engineer accidentally triggered one of his own traps, fired a shotgun blast into his neck, bled out, and died almost immediately. Police officers who found the man assumed that he committed suicide, then only discovered the truth when a detective nearly killed themselves opening a wooden chest. It took authorities three weeks to decode the insane engineer's clues, find the rest of the booby traps. If you've seen any of the Saw films, you'll appreciate the media referring to him as a real-life jigsaw. What a terrible Saw movie his story would make. Like, instead of a franchise, it would just be a one-and-done short film. Just, would you like to play a game? In this room, you will find your grisly fate. All of you will die. Unless you can... Ow, ow, f fuck! I've just, I've just shot myself. Hey, look, new game, everybody. Listen, forget about the last game. New game is who can get an ambulance here the fastest. Just the code to get out of the room you're trapped in is 666. Please, I'm bleeding a lot. This is not the game I was hoping to play. I'm so sorry to waste everyone's time. Now let's get historical for some Darwin Awards. The Darwin Awards technically began in the early 90s, but stupid deaths have been happening since before meat sacks were even living in caves. To start, we head to the 19th century, more specifically to November 6, 1816. A man named Governor Morris, yes, his parents named him Governor, uh, would go on to become a senator. This guy is actually the author of the preamble to the U.S. Constitution, known as the penman of the Constitution, a founding father, one of the dudes who signed the Articles of Confederation and the U.S. Constitution, led a very successful life, and then exited with a needless death. Dude died from shoving, I swear, a whalebone into his urethra when he was 64. And no, this isn't another weird-ass Albert Fish joke. It wasn't, hello, my baby, hello, my darling, stick a whalebone in my ween. bum 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 ba -dum -ba. Now, Morris died from an infection after he decided to try the medical procedure of clearing out his urethra blockage himself, despite being friends with Benjamin Franklin, who invented the flexible catheter back in 1752. You can accomplish so, so much, you can be incredibly successful and still die because of one terrible lapse in judgment. 
Um, yeah, and then we have another one coming up here soon. There's an incredible lapse in judgments. The lesson here specifically is to not shove a whalebone inside your dick or any other place. Our next historical Darwin Award winner, we go all the way back to the 12th century. Holy Roman Emperor Frederick I was busy on the Third Crusade to recapture the Holy Land. He and his army had trudged across a dry summer desert, and then they came to a river they needed to cross. Frederick, still wearing his heavy armor, was just so thirsty and just not in his right frame of mind, he decided just to jump right away into the river without taking off his armor, sank to the bottom, and drowned. For those of you who have listened to Napoleon episode, Suck 134, you may remember several of Napoleon's men doing the same thing when they got really thirsty. Another good lesson here, next time you're dressed up in heavy armor, take it off before jumping into a deep body of water. Even if, it's a, even if it's a pool. Hard for lifeguards to save somebody at the YMCA swimming pool if they've dressed in chainmail. You're supposed to leave your armor in the locker room. And for our last award winner, this is actually my favorite one. We head to the 19th century. In 1863, Arguably intelligent person, a lawyer named Clement Valadingham. Weird name. Valen, 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 Valen Fucking stupid name. Valen Dig Ham combined. Maybe, maybe this is, maybe, maybe he wanted to die. Maybe he had that name for too long and he wanted out of here. Th- this guy, this lawyer, had been banished from the North for his anti-Lincoln speeches and was representing a client who had allegedly committed a murder with a gun. The accused man's defense was that the victim had drawn his own gun in a fashion that caused it to fire and kill himself. To prove the defense argument, Clement demonstrated the victim's method of drawing a gun using a fucking loaded evidence gun as a prop. The firearm went off. He lost his life, but I guess proved his case. Like what, what the fuck? Do you understand here? He is trying to prove that a loaded gun can in fact go off when you, when you just draw it in a careless manner and, and you can kill yourself. And, and to do that, he demonstrates exactly that. And it works. Your Honor, I assure you that it is quite simple to accidentally shoot oneself when improperly drawing a loaded weapon. Allow me to demonstrate by improperly drawing a loaded weapon. If my hypothesis is correct, I shall be very dead in a few moments. And my client shall be a free man who I hope has the decency to attend my funeral and thank my lifeless body. So that's it. So that's it, Meat Sacks. I, I, I found this suck to be more educational than I thought it would be. I'm going to be honest. I didn't want to do this suck. This is, this is a space lizard topic voted in. When I saw it on the voting board, I was like, nope, don't want it. Don't want to do it. I get it. It's a, it's a, it's a quick little joke. But it became for me a nice reminder of, of the many things that we're not supposed to do. It just a reminder that none of us are immune from dying a needless death. It, it can be easy to laugh off Darwin Award winners, you know, doing shit where we think we're too smart to do. But I bet each and every one of us can think of a moment when had basically a coin toss gone the other way, we could have easily ended up on today's list. I could have ended up on today's list so many times. I remember jumping off a roof into a pool of water four feet deep back in high school. I hurt my feet, somehow didn't die. And, and it was and, and the the pool, you had to jump over a considerable distance to make it into the water. One slip and you just land on the side of the pool. Uh, I remember stepping out in, into the street, hammer drunk back in college, getting honked at by a car that just had to swerve to avoid running me over. Almost blew myself up as I t- uh, you know back in high school trying to make a bomb. Almost sliced my hand off with a skill saw just a few years ago when I decided I don't need saw horses. I can just hold some shit on my leg and cut it. Uh, you know, just dicking around, running, running uh, down a mountainside once when I was a junior high, I almost ran straight off a cliff. Luckily, a buddy who was with me grabbed me before I just flew off the edge and on and on and on. So many examples. Whether or not you believe in evolution, please believe that the Reaper doesn't give a fuck about you or anybody else. Don't make the Grim Reaper's job any easier than that cold-blooded job needs to be than it already is. So hail Nimrod. Don't die in the ways we've just talked about. And now it is time for today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, the first major takeaway is what I just said. This could be you or me. Of all the stupid things that people do, it's not that big of a stretch for any of us to end up like some of these folks. Like we just learned, not even a high level of education can save you from winning an award nobody wants to win. Number two, Never push a whalebone into your pee hole or any other hole. Stay away from whalebones. Number three, don't have a poisonous snake for a pet or any other reason. Seriously. No one who is cool thinks that is cool. 
You want a snake? Fine. Get one that won't kill you with one bite. Number four, uh, evolution is more than just a theory. It's been proven. Creatures evolve. Think of those blue mussels and the peppered moth. There is more to learn, but all signs point to evolution being extremely factual. Also, evolving from monkeys doesn't negate religion, especially if you view scripture as symbolic rather than literal. Science and religion can be friends. They can get along. I know that for a fact because Nimrod and Lucifina told me. And number five, new info. Let's look at one last interesting Darwin Award. There were a number of Darwin Awards linked to extreme kind of X game type extreme sports. Guys skiing into helicopter blades, purposely trying to start an avalanche only to die in it. There are fun water sports stories like a guy trying to rewire his jet ski while in the water and electrocuting himself. There are more than a couple bungee jumping incidents where people forgot that bungee cords, cords stretch and they would smash their brains into the earth below. Also, at least one claim of a man trying to go real extreme and ride his jet ski off of a waterfall. Let's talk about him. 1995, a particularly daring daredevil named Robert decided to attempt something no one had ever attempted before because it's extremely fucking stupid. He tried to ride his jet ski off of Niagara Falls. Lindsay and I went to Niagara Falls last year and one look at it and you can quickly assess that's a great way to die. To be fair, Robert did fit his jet ski with a parachute, but he failed to take into an account or take into account how racing through water and into rapids of the falls would make his parachute apparatus very, very wet. He also had a rocket apparatus built into the jet ski to shoot him out away from the falls so he could deploy his parachute, but rocket boosters and lots and lots of water don't make the best of friends. As Robert hurtled toward the falls and pressed the button, his utterly soaked rocket booster failed to ignite. Plummeting off the edge, he tried to parachute, but this, this parachute wasn't waterproof either and failed to deploy. The only thing Robert accomplished was plummeting to an easily avoidable death. Don't be a Robert, meat sacks. Do everything you can to stick around. Be a Bobbert. Do you hear any stories about Bobbert dying in any of these stories? You sure didn't. Don't be Robert. Be Bobbert. Time suck. Top five takeaways. All right, our Darwin, epi- uh, our Darwin Award episode has been sucked. Ho- hope you enjoyed a different kind of episode. Um, ho- hope you didn't mind my pauses. It's just a little different when you're bouncing kind of from topic to topic. It's my, my brain. I've, I've trained it in a different way. It was a, it was a challenge for me. Hopefully it was a fun challenge. Hope you enjoyed a look into evolution and, and a look into several things to never, ever do. Uh, thanks to the Time Suck team. Thanks to Queen of the Suck, Lindsay Cummins, High Priest of the Suck, Harmony Valley Camp, Jesse Guardian of Grammar Dobner, Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley, Time Suck High Priest, Alex Dugan, the guys at Bit Elixir. Danger Brain, Axis Apparel. Thanks to Zach Scriptkeeper Flannery for lining up all of our good Darwin Award winners and giving me a good, good peek at Charles Darwin and uh, evolution. Next week, very excited for this topic. I've been thinking about it for a long, long time. We're going to talk about America's homeless epidemic. Next week on Time Suck, we're going to take a close look at the homeless situation in America. Data reveals that over 1.7 million people will experience homelessness this year. Terrifying. That's a lot of meat sacks. Number of questions that we hope to answer with this suck. Who are these folks? How many of your kids, vets, single mothers, living out in the street and in shelters? How did it get this way? Has it improved over the years or gotten worse? What can we do to make it better? What are the causes of homelessness? What do people who live without a home say about it? Our mission is to understand the nuances and think rationally and critically about this subject. We found this to be an emotional and controversial topic to many. When we understand that the human default position for all of human history is poverty, how does today's homeless situation compare to other nations and to our own history? Is it better to be homeless in San Francisco than it is in Moscow or Tokyo? Which nations do the best job with the homeless? Who needs the most help? According to several recent studies, much of America is just two paychecks away from becoming homeless themselves. How do we as a society do better than that? If we can't offer any potential solutions to this problem, at the very least, we can arrive at a better understanding of the situation by taking a good, hard look at it, and that's a step in the right direction. And now let's take another step in the right direction. Let's check in with you wonderful meat sacks within the cult of the curious with today's Time Sucker Updates. Updates? Get your Time Sucker Updates. Starting off with a missed joke opportunity brought to my attention by Madeline Masters, Time Sucker Madeline writes, Master Sucker, I cannot believe you did not say load the Greg, aim the Greg, fire the Greg one single time during the King Arthur suck. Especially when there was an excellent scene in Monty Python's The Holy Grail that includes catapulting livestock over the castle walls. Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley loves that scene. He was uh, showing me a great Game of Thrones, Monty Python mashup involving that very scene. Uh, That's all I have to say. 
Thanks for all you do. Love, Maddie. Well, thank you, Maddie. And damn it, that would have been perfect. Got too many jokes to keep track of now. Could have snuck that, though, into one of the stories. Just load the Merlin. Aim the Merlin. Fire the wizard. And now a historical King Arthur update coming in from Justine Tabor. Justine writes, Greetings, O Lord of the Suck, King of the Curious, and Bojangles Best Human. I backpacked Europe a few years ago. How lucky are you? That's awesome. Was lucky enough to visit the village of uh, Heistadt. Sp- spelled Hallstatt. Uh, so according to Justine, I'm going to go with Justine since she's been there. Heistadt, where they still have the world's oldest and most continuous in-use salt mine. You can tour and ride down in a super sweet slide. That's awesome. In addition to their salt mines, the citizens of Heistadt have a few other amazing bits of history to them. Back during the Nazi invasion of Austria, the village, located on a small plot of land facing a massive lake and set in some mountains. I've seen pictures and it's gorgeous. The village bombed out or barricaded the tunnel that cuts through the mountains for travel to ensure that the Nazis would not be able to reach them and claim their historical artifacts or destroy their salt mines. That's amazing. Also, in Heistadt, it bo- is a bone house where all who die in the village eventually end up. Once a citizen has died and been buried, the only, they only stay in the ground long enough to decompose before they are dug up and prepared to be displayed in the bone house. A sacred place, the bone house is connected to the village's church and visitors can tour through it if they like and as long as they remain respectful. Skulls are treated and painted by the families of those who have passed and had their bones placed on one of the shelves. Typically, flowers or hearts are used for children and other symbols representative of the deceased are used for adults. Wow, what an interesting tradition. Due to their isolationism at different points in human history, the village of Heislat has managed to maintain a modest population and hold on to their culture's very special and specific values. It's a gorgeous place to visit and an amazing place to study for anyone interested in anthropology or sociology. Hail Lucifina, keep on sucking. Nimrod's faithful servant, Justin Justine Tabor. P.S. I don't know if you remember, but you and I spoke over Facebook a little over a year ago and how much the suck means to me about how much the suck means to me and how it helped me deal with the trauma and anxiety of my then recent car wreck as I had to drive about four hours every week for physical therapy. Yes. Well, I'm no longer in physical therapy. I've had a third surgery since that time. The suck and the cult of the curious members continue to hold a special place in my heart. I can't wait to see you in Portland this October for my second year of surviving my wreck. I'll be bringing my boyfriend and a friend who I introduced to the suck, Crystal. Well, I do remember you, Justine. I'm so glad you're doing better. And thank you for sharing all of this information about Heistadt and how to say it. Now I really want to go visit this, this little place. I'm glad the Cult of the Curious is able to help you out. I'm glad you're getting friends involved in the Cult of the Curious, spread the suck. And yeah, what a long, interesting tradition this little village has had. Now I, I got I to gotta get there one of these days. Some misdirect, misdirection anger. And then some praise coming in now from Adam Ritchie. Adam writes, Hey, Master Sucker, you wonderful meat sack. I was going to wait to send in an email with a whole bunch of praise. And the one time you got me with the misdirect until I was caught up and officially a space lizard. Well, fuck that. And fuck you, goddammit. You got my blood boiling today as I was finishing the Casey Anthony suck. Seriously, I was super pissed <laughs> when you said she was running to daycare. I'm at work when I listen and I damn near shouted, are you fucking kidding me? And you finally said she'd lost kids there and a twisted... Piss smile came across my face. Well played, sir. Well play- played. Saying that, I may as well tell you also got me with the McGill's pop. I have digestive problems that tend to have me on the toilet too much. When you said people were blowing out their asshole from cholera, I was genuinely worried, genuinely worried thinking, oh, shit, that'll be me soon. <laughs> now, every time I hear you say it, I giggle a bit. Should have warned you this was going to be long-winded. I love the podcast and your stand-up, as do my kids. Like so many, I found you on Pandora, but I found the podcast through an old app I was using. I use the Time Suck app now. Listen to the order of the sample Solar Temple Doomsday Cult and said, I'm going back through the whole catalog. Holy shit, I'm glad I did. There have been a few I've skipped because the Amityville scared the shit out of me and that's not my bag. Since I've joined the Cult of Curious, shout out to all the Time Suck meat sacks out there. You guys renew my faith in humanity every day. Uh, Now to praise you, Dan, I mentioned earlier, I want to thank you for not giving up on this podcast and the community that is born from it. I'm a huge fan of stand-up and know the long hours, lots of travel, shitty gigs. Yeah. Multiple lows that, that hit for those willing to commit to it. Me, I'm afraid to go get up there. But to do that and spend so much time creating this baby now monster of a podcast to, to stretch you thin, I thank you again. I also recently watched your TEDx talk. Very well done. When I finished, I believe that you, that I believed that had you not gone the route you did in comedy, you would have made one hell of a college professor teaching critical thinking. I'd have taken that class with a professor like you and many others would have too. 
Anyway, I could keep going, but I'll stop. Hail Nimrod, keep on sucking. Your soon-to-be space lizard, Adam Ritchie. P.S. If you don't mind, I'd like to write the legend of the prophet of Nimrod, Dr. Reverend General Dan Cummins, and his final defeat of the underworld minions, Alex Jones, David Icke, and Ignorance. <laughs> also not sure if you saw the YouTube video posted about five months ago now about Elisa Lamb, apparently. It was someone else on the video because she had teleported. That's what they're saying. I fucking laughed my ass off at this ridiculous video. Uh, I haven't seen that video. That does sound, yep, exactly like the kind of shit I look at the internet, on the internet. Would, would love to get some fan fiction. Please, please write that, Adam. And thanks for all that. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I, I, I did think many years ago when I was younger about staying in school to become a professor. And I'm so glad I didn't actually because I have temper issues. <laughs> and it works out for stand-up. Stand up, somebody's being rude to the show, I can just verbally abuse them and say anything I think about them. That would not work in a classroom setting. I'm glad I'm aware of that. Now a sweet message from a very sweet man. I have met many times now a man who I'm so happy has found his tribe, Mr. Chase Hender, great space lizard, time sucker. He writes, Dear Dan Cum, Joe Diggs, Zacharias, Queen of the Suck, everyone else doing fantastic work for the cult and curious. This may be a bit lengthy, but I've got to get this off my chest. For starters, you may remember me from Salt Lake. I do. I gave you a card. I asked you what your dream in life was. To be honest, I forgot what your answer was. I, I fucking forgot to. Anyway, so like you, Dan, I despise idiocy amongst the population that I interact with every day in life. I couldn't pinpoint why. It wasn't until you, Dan, st st stating in Secret Suck episode 64, explaining how and why you make fun of people that mislead, doing more harm than good, that I realized why I can't stand certain people. So I and my older and younger siblings have grown up raised by a wackadoodle of a father. He believed in so many ridiculous things. MK Ultra, chemtrails, government's hidden agendas, 9-11 being demolished with thermite explosive, just to name a few. With him as an influencer of what to believe, I started becoming quite lonely at school, thinking that everyone was fools, they, didn't, they weren't properly informed. I became very introverted and disconnected. There were days where he sat our asses in front of the TV watching hours of DVDs of the propaganda that he believed in. It wasn't until I started high school and my dad having his own radio show that I started doubting what he was teaching me and my siblings. I started thinking more rationally, decided to believe the evidence backing up what people claimed to be true. It was also around this time that my father was three years into being diagnosed with alpha-1 antitrepsin, maybe spelled wrong. Yeah, I don't. I, he was re, uh, receiving a weekly drain of the liquids that built up in his belly from his liver, as well as taking medications from his wackadoodle friends. It wasn't until my senior year in the fourth quarter that things started taking a turn for the worse. There was one to two months of school left. My dad went to the hospital more frequently, which had an effect on my determination on my schoolwork, which infuriated him. In mid-May, he got pissed at my siblings and I for not going to church while he went to the hospital for an emergency. Twice within five to seven days, he went into a comatose state. He was awake, but his brain wasn't there. It was like he was sleepwalking, but worse. I tried to explain to him what happened the next day, and it must have depressed the hell out of him. My mom lost her shit and told my dad's friends to take their medical shit and to never come back. After that, he had another emergency hospital run, came back three days later, going into painful details with my brother and I of how he was stabbed several times with a catheter. Apparently, it wasn't working right the first few times. I remember helping him with his heating pad, adjusting it under his back, saying, I want to do everything I can to help. The next morning, I found him asleep on the couch next to my mom. I decided to let him sleep because of how much hell he went through recently. He didn't wake up and was in a coma for the rest of his life. We decided to pull the plug on him because it would be better than being a vegetable for the rest of his life. During everything that happened, my dad didn't take the doctor-approved medications. He took whatever ple placebo effect pills that his quote-unquote friends had given him. I have pain because my dad decided to believe in people who weren't licensed or, have, or didn't have the legal rights to treat him properly. I despise idiocy because it was due to ignorant people claiming to know better than licensed doctors that my dad died. I try to be as understanding as possible, but it fucking hurts when ignorance leads to someone else being hurt. I found Time Suck in 2016, started listening religiously, agreeing with most, agreeing with what, uh, with most of what you say. I, I love those, by the way. I love, I don't think one message has ever come in where someone's like, hey man, I agree with everything you say. I know that I can be a little bit of a loose cannon. Agreeing with most of what you say, except the Roanoke recluse spider. It was because of our cult of the curious that I've expanded the way I think and treat others. And I would like to personally thank you Joe, the previous Reverend Doctor, Lindsay, is that how you spell it? You got it close. Zach and everyone else doing their work to make time suck and the secret suck what they are today. Well, thank you so much, Chase. I, I too find it refreshing to realize there's, there's like-minded folk out there. People who get as turned off by these wackadoodles as I do. 
people who generally just uh, get frustrated by wanton, lazy ignorance and need a place to vent. So glad you found us, Chase. So sorry about your dad. Hail Nimrod, my friend. I'll see you again in Salt Lake City. And that is it for today. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Have a great week, everybody. Don't fuck with dangerous animals or fight on the freeway this week. Or even worse, don't fight with a dangerous animal on a freeway. If you check out early, how are you supposed to keep on sucking? Bye, Chuck! Bye, Chuck! Bye, Chuck!